Okay, I think that we can start if someone join us a little bit later, they can join us freely, no problem at all. So thank you for coming to make Azure command line tools work better for you. My name is Alexander Nikolic. I'm a Azure and PowerShell trainer and also one of the co-founders of PowerShellMagazine.com. Maybe you are aware of it. It's in a kind of a hibernation for years now, but still the archive there is pretty decent. And if you are new to PowerShell or even if you're not new and you still want to kind of learn about certain things, I think it's valid, right? I mean, we haven't updated things for a long time because life happens, different things in life, and, and six people that were behind it are kind of now doing different things in life. So, so it's just there, right? So uh, when we say Azure Command Line Tools, what we are talking about is Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI, okay? How many of you are familiar with Azure PowerShell and use it on like a almost daily basis kind of thing? No, not a lot, but okay. Azure CLI? That's what I thought, okay. So this is a PowerShell conference, but we will still talk about Azure CLI a lot because I will explain you through the workshop why it's important, I think, to also know Azure CLI. It doesn't matter that you are PowerShell guy that you're a user and that you want to use PowerShell all the time, but in certain cases, Azure CLI will be almost kind of unavoidable, okay? So it's good to know how both of those tools work. Why even have them, really, why? Right? The main reason is to automate routine operations that we have. Today, when you talk about uh, working with the code and Azure, people will always tell you Bicep and a Terraform, right? Because this is what we, people will use to deploy resources to Azure. But that's not the end of a story, right? It's one thing to deploy, but then later you might need to check the status of certain things that are run in your Azure infrastructure. You cannot use Bicep or a Terraform for that. No. You need to find a different ways. Some people will go to a Azure portal to look at things or, or they will build some dashboards with the Azure monitor and some other ways to kind of graphically monitor stuff. But very often those things don't scale, right? So you need to get back to the command lines when you can kind of at scale monitor certain things, fetch interesting uh, information about stuff, react on them in case they are not working properly. Also, command line tools are available to you as a part of different services. If you use Azure Functions, you can use Azure PowerShell inside of the Azure Functions. If you use Azure Automation Service, you can use Azure PowerShell and PowerShell there. And recently, they added support for the Azure CLI as well in the run books. So that's another way to deal with uh, those things. And you will look at the command line tools as some kind of a glue that connects different Azure services and help you to get the best value out of everything when something is missing maybe in a portal or in some other tools, you can then build your own command or a function or full module to help you with that. Right. And for that, Azure PowerShell and Azure CLIs are kind of a great candidate to help you with. Also, if you write command line tools, commands, it's easier to share, right? Much easier than to take the screenshots of the portal. I always, I, there is always the thing like command line tools versus GUI. I think the Azure portal is great as a learning tool. This is something where you go at first when you're not very familiar with a certain service because it's easier to get that familiarity with a service in a portal with the help of a tool tips being guided through the wizards and the GUIs and those blades, right? It's pretty hard even for power users of Azure PowerShell to go and immediately script certain things with the service that it's very new to them and kind of a very often still in preview kind of thing, right? So those things are easier to try when you have a help of a, of a GUI there. 
the knowledge of and usage of command line tools is not always necessary, but it's very useful skill to have. I know a lot of people that are working and dealing with Azure without using command line tools. I seriously cannot understand how they do that from my perspective, because uh, I'm a user of PowerShell and Azure PowerShell since the better days. But they are somehow managed to do that. They're doing deployments through the templates, and then later they are going to uh, Azure portal and using that as a kind of a controlling what's happening and reacting on certain things, building alerts, and, and doing that way, right? They only use command line tools where they it's really kind of necessary for them to do it, or they know, don't know how to do certain task, and they go to documentation, and then they get a script from there, and then just kind of a blindly almost uh, reuse that in their own environments and hope that everything will work. Seriously, you will be surprised how that works in the real world, right? Very often people do that very blindly, like, like they will just get something or search for something, or now it's very popular to go to the AI engines, ask for the answer, and, and do it that way. So how does Azure CLI compare to Azure PowerShell? Uh, they're both cross-platform uh, tools, but the Azure CLI is a cross-platform command line interface when the PowerShell is a PowerShell, Azure PowerShell is a PowerShell module, which means that it works only on a PowerShell shell. It needs a PowerShell as a dependency, right? So it can work on it. The Azure CLI can work in other shells uh, as well. And it can work in a bash, and it can work in PowerShell 5.1 and in a 7. It can work in other Unix shells uh, as well. It can work in a command prompt. No, you cannot run PowerShell, Azure PowerShell directly in command prompt, for example. Uh, Azure CLI is based on Python. Azure PowerShell is based on PowerShell. Uh, a little bit of history of Azure CLI and why we even have two tools, right? It's kind of a confusing, like why we have two tools for the same goal to manage Azure resources from a command line. Azure PowerShell was the first. And uh, Microsoft needed something for Linux developers, for developers that are not working on a Windows admin stations or Windows laptops, because there is a huge group of users that used Mac laptops and Mac operating system to work on it, and they missed the tool there because at that time, PowerShell was not cross-platform. So Azure PowerShell could not run on Mac and Linux, and they needed something for that environment. So they created the first version of Azure CLI, and the first version of uh, Azure CLI was based on the Node.js, not on Python. And a little bit later, they completely have rewritten everything in Python because for some reason they found out some, not bugs, but just functionalities that were not kind of there and they thought like Python will be better, uh, more suitable for, for a job. And they then start from scratch and build the Azure CLI 2.0 that no one knows anymore as a 2.0 because it's now for so long with us that everyone just say Azure CLI and that's it, right? So at that, just because PowerShell was not cross-platform when they needed it, we now have two tools. And one thing that it's, uh, I think, wrong just because uh, Microsoft is somehow, let's say, lazy to provide documentation for both of them uh, at the same level with the same kind of parity. Most of the documentation about Azure CLI is written that runs in Bash. Also, you can run Azure CLI in PowerShell as well. And I will talk about that because I think that at a PowerShell conference, you are predominantly PowerShell users. And if you need to use Azure CLI, it would be great to use it in the same shell that you use for running PowerShell without changing the context and moving to a bash to run Azure CLI. But sometimes it would be impossible for you to just copy paste code from a documentation that it's written for running in bash and tested for running in bash 
to, without any changes, run in PowerShell, right? So instead of getting some nasty red letters of errors, it would be nice to know why that's happening and how can you, can fi how can you can fix that, okay? Uh, if you haven't tried Azure CLI so far, there's just a simple example here of a syntax to, to show you how different that is compared to uh, PowerShell. A PowerShell, we have that naming convention of a verb dash noun, right? Sometimes with a prefix. In case of Azure, PowerShell is AZ, okay? In syntax for Azure CLI is a little bit different. It always needs to start with the AZ, which is kind of a signal to, we are calling Azure CLI engine. And then we have a group of commands with practically represents a noun, like a storage. And then you have some subgroup, and then you have a verb, okay? Which is kind of a here command. So it's kind of a reversed. It's not verb dash noun, it's more like a noun and then a verb kind of thing, really, right? But the good thing is that it's very consistent. So you don't, once when you kind of get familiar with it, you don't need to kind of relearn it for every single new set of commands or something, they added a new features to the things, okay? It's just a little bit different, but after some learning, it's quite okay. So what shell environment should you use? You can see that you have lots of options for Azure CLI, because Azure CLI runs in Windows PowerShell, in PowerShell, in a bash, and in command prompt. Azure PowerShell runs only in Windows PowerShell and PowerShell, right? So with Azure CLI, you have options, okay? It's really on you, but you need to be aware that changing a shell when you run command changes your experience with it as well. Because there are certain things that are just different in a bash command prompt and PowerShell, right? And we need to work around them to make it kind of a usable in all those shells, right? Sometimes you cannot even pick. Right, so, so that you will use it. For example, if you run Azure CLI commands or Azure PowerShell commands in some runners or hosted agents in a CICD pipelines and things, and that runner is based on Linux and it comes with a bash, then you will run things running a bash. You will maybe build your custom one when you have also PowerShell available and then run things in a PowerShell if you want. But usually by default, if they're based on Linux, you will run things in a bash, okay? And that's something that kind of a comes with the runner, so you usually don't change that, really, right? But it's good to know how to kind of work around it. For people that are not users of Azure PowerShell so much, just a little bit of an intro that we are dealing here with a AZ module, which is kind of a mega module that contains a bunch of different modules. Usually those modules are connected to a services and different, different product groups responsible for services are also responsible for the PowerShell commands that will work with that service. And then on top of all that, you have a product manager who is kind of controlling everything. He controlling some of the things that are common for all of the groups and then the overall work on, on stuff, okay? Uh, the, you will get it from a PowerShell gallery is the most common way to install things. But you can also get the MSI file in a GitHub repo, but it works only in Windows PowerShell. You cannot use MSI to install Azure PowerShell on PowerShell 7. Just be aware of that, okay? Uh, the home of Azure PowerShell is in a GitHub. It's an open source project, so everything that you need is there. This is where you go when you have a problem. This is where you go if you can fix a problem for them as well. This is where you kind of go to see what's happening with the release notes and, and how things are going. I really recommend to all of you to go there, especially when they release a new version and they release new versions every month. Both releases of Azure CLI and Azure PowerShell are now in sync and they release monthly. I think they just break that around summer kind of thing, they, they kind of skip one month there. And uh, they have two, Azure PowerShell have two breaking changes releases per year. 
One is around Build Conference, which is in May, and another one is around Ignite Conference, which is in, Ju in November, okay? And now that's a for years kind of thing that people are, got used to, and it's very good to know, because uh, before they established that cadence of releasing stuff, there was a problem because they released a lot of those breaking changes, releases something intentionally, sometimes no, <laughs> just making mistakes and things, but now things are under much better control and people uh, kind of build better confidence using the tool because they know that twice a year we will have a breaking change. And you might say, but I don't want to update. I don't want to go to the breaking change release because if I do, I need to repeat all the testing to see how things are working, right? But if you are working with environments that are not under your control, that are managed by someone else, by Microsoft, they will not even ask you, right? So one of those environments is Azure Cloud Shell. Azure Cloud Shell is a service provided to us by Microsoft, and we will talk about it a little bit more uh, late, when you get uh, in a browser a shell environment when you can run Azure CLI and Azure PowerShell commands. And they have their own cadence of updating the image, container image that is behind everything, and you don't control that. So you need to be aware that at a certain point, they will go to the breaking change release, even if you locally or in your environment are maybe not ready for it. But you need to know what's happening in that environment because that environment is always available to you and you might use it for things because you don't need to add additional tools and install it. And we will talk about that environment a little bit later, right? So that's one of them. The same thing happens to the CI CD runners. You don't control what's there if you are using the ones that are provided by GitHub or Azure DevOps. If you're working with the custom ones, it's a different thing, right? But when you work with the managed stuff, you don't control those things. So that's why you need to be kind of prepared for that, even that you think maybe it's too early for me, I would like to go with a new version in six months kind of thing, right? But it's a constant change with Azure and you cannot kind of slow down because you need to follow to a certain extent what's happening. Another thing is that uh, you can run Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI also in the containers, which people don't uh, do very often, but it's quite useful and I will tell you why. Uh, with running things in a container, you can isolate yourself and Azure PowerShell from the other version of Azure PowerShell that you maybe have locally installed in your system. Or you can test a new version, a breaking change version in a container first and see how that works and then implement it on your system, right? How many of you have experience with running Docker's and Docker containers doing that stuff? Not so much. Because usually when people talk about containers, they talk about containers and their usage in a production for running your apps. But containers are great as uh, dev tools, as just an environment that you use for running your tools because it allows you to have a different versions and different set of tools, depending on a project, all contained in the isolated environment. So I did experiment a couple of years ago when the things started, running one laptop with the things only in containers. So if containers are not running, that system was the same on the 1st of January and 31st of December. The only thing that was changed were the Windows updates. I didn't want to put anything outside of containers in the system. So I have different containers for different environments and different things. That was even before Visual Studio Code started supporting that as a running environment for your stuff. So I really recommend all of you to kind of try doing it because with the dev containers and the way how you can work with the Visual Studio Code and connect and run things in a container seamlessly that looks like it's actually running locally for you, but having that confidence that you are not with a DLL hell and a version hell for PowerShell modules and, and all that stuff, it really building a great development experience for things. Where is CLI? 
similar thing. Same goal to manage resources, cross-platform, runs in Cloud Shell as well, runs in container as well. Those containers that I'm uh, talking about, and we will talk about them a little bit more uh, very soon, their container images are created by Microsoft, by Azure CLI and Azure PowerShell team. Those are the official ones. And they run in a different operating system, different Linux distributions, so that you can pick the one that suits you. And you can kind of uh, use that one directly or use it as a base for building your custom container image that you will use inside of your organization, okay? There is one thing that Azure CLI has that I would like to see in, in Azure PowerShell, but it doesn't exist there, called AZ Interactive, which allows you to run AZ in a CLI in an interactive mode to help you learn Azure CLI. That AZ Interactive is uh, not installed by default, but the first time you run AZ Interactive, it will actually add extension to Azure CLI. Extension in Azure CLI is like a module in PowerShell. No? Just a set of commands that will extend the functionality that you have. And then you will have that interactive mode that will help you with the tool tips, examples, short explanations about the things that are happening, drop downs for uh, potential values, valid values for things, great learning environment. For people that have never tried it, really one of the best ways to interact first with Azure CLI and learn it that way. You will see that in a, in a demo. Again, just, just to kind of remind you of the difference with the syntax with the Azure CLI, with the groups, subgroups, command, and then parameters, okay? The parameters in Azure CLI are always prefixed with a double hyphen compared to a single one in a PowerShell, but that's kind of the only difference for the parameters. Uh, in PowerShell, we have common parameters, the parameters that exist for every single commandlet, in Azure CLI, they call it global uh, parameters or global arguments, right? But it's the same purpose, like they are supported for every single command that you have and that you use. How can you use them, right? So the first thing is that they run cross-platform on all three platforms that are now uh, used and uh, Microsoft provides a great installation documentation for uh, both of the tools for all the supported uh, platforms that you can use to run them. Uh, as I said, you can run both of them in a PowerShell, and then you can run Azure CLI in those other shells. Uh, you can use Windows Subsystem for Linux, WSL, which is just a great way to run a Linux distribution on your Windows uh, system. Do we have any users of WSL in the room? Not a single one? Heard you heard about it, yeah. That's, a, that's, a, that's a strange, you're missing opportunity, seriously. Because uh, you can have both Windows and Linux very easily on your machine if you, have, if you have Windows 11 or a certain newer versions of Windows 10. WSL is just a super easy way to get access to a couple of Linux distributions on a system that are just so easy to use there, it looks like uh, it, you run just another shell in your environment. So in case that you need to run something in Bash, you just go to the Windows terminal, you click Bash instead of PowerShell and you have a Bash environment when you can run stuff. Great way to do it. Then we have Azure Cloud Shell that I mentioned service managed by Microsoft that gives you access to both of those tools. And then we have Visual Studio Code. So first thing is that if you move to PowerShell 7, and I hope that all of you did that already, do we still have some Windows PowerShell users? No? All PowerShell 7? That's good. So we all know that with PowerShell 7, we, need, we cannot use PowerShell IC anymore, right? PowerShell IC doesn't support PowerShell 7. So we needed to use Visual Studio Code with a PowerShell extension. Visual Studio Code is amazing tool, seriously. Like, 
one of the best things that Microsoft produced, if you ask me. It's a cross-platform, open source, and free. And it's super capable of working with the different programming languages, supports PowerShell, Azure PowerShell, and CLI as well. You can connect it, you can connect Cloud Shell and make it available inside of Visual Studio Code. You can connect from Visual Studio Code to your containers and use it that way, locally, great, great tool. And then I already mentioned those Docker containers that we can use for running both tools. So what about Azure Cloud Shell? It's a hosted shell environment that runs in a browser. What runs behind it uh, is a Linux container. It started as a Ubuntu container. Then they changed it for a very short period of time to Debian. And then they moved to something called CBL Mariner, which is a Microsoft-made Linux distribution. And then they rebranded it last year to Azure Linux. So you will still see in the code CBL Mariner, but it's actually Azure Linux. And this is how uh, documentation now makes reference to that uh, Linux distribution. Uh, it was kind of a clear from the start that Microsoft will end with its own Linux distribution to support whatever they do, because they are uh, basing lots of services on Linux distributions. And they used for a couple of years Ubuntu almost like its own. They own it. And, and there was a rumor that they might kind of a, uh, buy the guys, canonical, be, be, they are behind uh, Ubuntu, that didn't happen, especially when IBM bought uh, Red Hat, right? Then the uh, world didn't collapse. Nothing really changed. And it was kind of a clear, like, no one will then complain if Microsoft do the same to canonical, but that didn't happen. Reason for it was probably that Microsoft already started working on its own, and now we have the Azure Linux. We have actually a couple of Linux distributions made by Microsoft. I don't know if you're aware of that. One of the first was Azure Sphere. That's something that I never tried because uh, it's kind of a very specific Linux distributions for working with some IoT stuff, I think. Something like that. But then this Azure Linux is now getting more and more into Azure kind of things. And it's supporting the Cloud Shell as well. So. Initially, you will enable it in a browser, but then you can continue using it in a browser if you want it, but you can also use it from Windows Terminal or Visual Studio Code. Running it from Visual Studio Code is my favorite way of using it. And the reason for it is that it gives me a great opportunity to write my code in the editor of Visual Studio Code, but then run it in a Cloud Shell that it's represented as just another terminal in a Visual Studio Code, which is just magic for me. You select something in the editor that it's running locally, and you press F8, and it goes over a wire to some data center of Microsoft, to some Linux distribution, and then it runs there, and I see the results in the terminal under my editor. Isn't that amazing? I mean, we are not even aware anymore about those things. They just look like they should work kind of, <laughs> kind of thing. But if someone told you 10 years ago that you will do it that way on a Microsoft tool <laughs> targeting Linux distribution, you will be kind of a surprise with that, I hope. <laughs> right? Now it's kind of a, almost natural. The thing is that. Uh, you have access to two shells there. You have access to a bash. You have access to a, a PowerShell. And uh, if you look at documentation, they say the bash environment comes pre-installed with Azure CLI, and the PowerShell one comes pre-installed with Azure PowerShell, which is not true. That Linux operating system is pre-installed with both of those tools. It's just that you cannot use PowerShell in a bash. right? It's not different. It's not that when you are picking uh, a different shell that something changes. It changes in a way that it just starts PowerShell or a bash. That, that's the only difference. It's the same container. Right? Historically, it was not that, that way. 
the first thing that they built was a Bash environment based on a Linux distribution. And then the PowerShell team looked at that. It's like, oh, this is interesting. We should build a PowerShell experience for a Cloud Shell, and we will base that on Windows Server Core container. The only problem with that was that Windows Server Core container needed 45 seconds to start PowerShell experience, when the Bash experience usually started in three seconds. But at that time, when they start doing that, PowerShell didn't run cross-platform, OK? So at the moment when PowerShell started running cross-platform, they said, we don't need two separate operating systems anymore. So we will pick the faster one, right? And we will base both PowerShell and Bash experience on a Linux container. And this is what they did. But they just, for historical reasons, they kept the drop down for picking different shells. But it's absolutely the same functionality if you pick that in a, browse, in a user experience, in a, in, a, in a GUI, or if you start it in a bash and you type PWSH and start PowerShell. There is no difference. It's absolutely the same thing. It's just a different way how you started PowerShell. Right. Is it a button or just I typed four letters? That, that's the only difference. Oh. So before we go to a code, till the rest of the workshop, which Azure command line tool is right for you, right? So you usually should think about your experience and your work environment, right? If you are working in a predominantly environment that is based on a Linux ecosystem, then Azure CLI looks more natural to you, OK? If you worked previously with the Windows on-premises, with the Windows Active Directory and domain and, and all of that, and you are familiar with the PowerShell, then Azure PowerShell makes more sense to you, really, right? So you will kind of uh, pick things based on your experience if it's possible, because that will kind of shorten the learning curve for, for all of that. But then you will come up to a, a point, then you will realize that certain things run uh, better or are just supported in one of them. And maybe that other tool is Azure CLI. So for example, Azure Kubernetes Service is, is known for being very well supported in Azure CLI, but not so much in Azure PowerShell. It's getting better now than it used to be Two years ago, it was a big difference between the, uh, the capabilities of a tool, tools, but now it's a little bit better. But still, people behind Azure Kubernetes Services are almost all coming from a Linux background, so they prefer Azure CLI. The content owners for Microsoft Learn Documents prefer Azure CLI, and they provide examples and documentation using Azure CLI as a command line tool for managing uh, Kubernetes services. So if you work with that service, it really makes sense for you to then work with Azure CLI kind of thing. And you will see that it, it, Microsoft always uh, says that they're working, and that's true. They're working on a parity. They would like us to be able to use both of those tools just because we pick one of those and not because we are working with certain service and the service is forcing us to use one of them, really, right? Because they want us to have a choice, but that takes time, it looks like. All right. And also, I see today that when they are releasing new stuff, they are always kind of picking Azure CLI first to test if things are working there, and then they are adding PowerShell a little bit later. Right? We have a few, I don't know if you are following things that are happening with the PowerShell community on Twitter. Today, it's kind of a, or for the last year, it's kind of a bad what's happening there. They kind of killed the PowerShell community on, on Twitter uh, with uh, Elon <laughs> taking over uh, everything. But before that, we had really very vocal discussions there when people were PowerShell users were uh, thought that uh, Microsoft is not treating PowerShell as a first class citizen when we work with, uh, with Azure. And uh, Azure CLI is somehow favorite 
of the management and, and uh, how all things are. Things are better now, well, still not as good as I would like them to be, but it's kind of better and it's getting better because the product manager uh, that's now responsible for Azure PowerShell is also responsible for Azure CLI. So they, uh, Microsoft is now treating both tools as uh, Azure command line tools, right? They're not separated teams, right? It's kind of a, uh, always looking at as a whole, let's build both tools to be good, which is always better for us because it will give us a choice. Then we can pick what we can use, okay? Again, expect to see a certain uh, differences with the uh, supporting services in, in stuff that happens here and there. So now we will move to uh, demo and, and to code till the end of the workshop. Do you have any feedback so far? By the way, you are invited to ask me questions during a whole workshop. Don't wait till the end or being shy and then talk later in the hallway. Also, I, I'm available for that as well. So people already know that uh, during breakfast and lunch, uh, we can talk about certain things, no problem at all. Any question? I, I have a question. Sure. Um, how does, is Azure PowerShell, Azure CLI completely different from uh, what you have Azure DevOps uh, API calls? Or do, do the API calls use one of the two? No. So both uh, Azure CLI and Azure PowerShell talk to Azure SDK. So uh, at, at the end, uh, they both talk to the same uh, APIs, but a, a little bit kind of uh, differently. And there is some uh, development movements right now to, to make it better. And I will show you that at the end of a workshop, some preview about uh, how they try to fix that problem so that uh, you will not be aware once when you see deployed resource. Is that resource deployed through the portal, through the Azure CLI, through the Azure PowerShell, or a BICEP, or Terraform? You will kind of uh, see and get it, and it's like, okay, like I cannot tell, because right now you can tell if something is created by a BICEP, or Azure portal, or a command line tool. Because when you create it through a portal, or a BICEP, what runs behind is deployment of a template, okay? Even when you write a BICEP template, it's then transpiled into a JSON template, and then JSON template is sent to Azure Resource Manager engine, and then you get the resources, okay? Same thing happens when you go through the portal, but in portal, certain things are kind of abstracted for you. So when you are filling in the forms, it's not the same kind of parameters that you need to use when you are writing a BICEP file or any other way, right? Certain things are kind of a hidden from you so that it's easier for you, but in you get, again, that template that it's sent. When you right now work with Azure PowerShell and, and Azure CLI, it's not that once when you press enter that the template will be created for you and sent to the Azure Resource Manager. That would be ideal, right? So they are doing certain changes to make that happen. And when that happens, it would be easier and better for all of us because we will have consistency with the different tools, not just Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI, but also with other tools, right? So that would be really great. Azure DevOps as, as a service is, is a completely different service that has its own API. And we're, I'm not aware of uh, CLI tools for working Azure DevOps service, anyone? Is there any? I'm, I'm really not aware of that. There is one tool that you might have heard of called Azure Developer CLI, AZD. Have you heard about that? So that's the one that it's created primarily with the developer in mind. When the, the deployment is based on a, on a templates, they're building they can build very complex environments, complex resources in, in Azure. But that's not Azure CLI, that's not Azure PowerShell. That's just another one. They didn't want to, for some reason, to make it part of Azure CLI. Also, at certain point, it looked like it can be just extension to Azure CLI, but it's built as a, just another tool by another team. You know? Azure CLI 
team in Azure Developer CLI team separate things, okay? So, so our, our first break should be at, we started at 1.30, so it should be at 3, right? Okay. So uh, I will share a code uh, at the end of a of conference uh, with you. I need to find with the organizers. Will they provide some GitHub repo for sharing things, or should I share on my repo or something? So we will find a way for you. So uh, I wanted for this first uh, section here to give you a, a bunch of links to documentation because I think it's very important to get that additional information outside of just working with the command line tools. The reason for it is that the changes are so frequent on a monthly basis. So you need to be aware of the release notes. You need to be aware of like what changed compared to the version that was released a month ago or two months ago, right? Because it's already hard to keep track and if they put an effort to release the list of changes, we should be aware of it. You will not go and, and look at all of them because they are covering changes in the whole set of commands that have, but there are certain services that you work with and you, you would like to know what's there. They also provide information about upcoming breaking changes so that you can prepare yourself, okay? You might have uh, noticed already because it's like that for more than a year, I think, that very often when they have some big breaking changes, they emit the warning messages when you run command that will be different in the future so that you can prepare yourself. You can also configure both Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI to hide those warning messages if they kind of uh, distract you and annoy you, but it's kind of a good at first to, to be aware of the things that will happen because then you will have more time to prepare yourself for those changes, okay? So uh, all of those things are pretty well documented for both tools, Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI. You have great tools for installing it on all different uh, environments, uh, release notes, breaking changes, and also they always provide in Azure PowerShell when they move from uh, one major uh, version uh, to the, another one, they provide migration guide. Because that's the one that contains the breaking changes and you need to know how to work with those breaking changes. So they will give you a guide that will tell you what are those and how can you actually implement it so that it will work when you move to a new version. The latest one is the migration to 11.0 because the latest version is 11.5. So once when they move to version 12, we will get another migration guide for the new version. Question? I do have a question. Sure. Uh, the shortcut I can find kind of links to online documentation is Wikipedia. Yeah. Wikipedia is just installing Azure RM over top of our module. Uh, so the latest. Azure RM? Yes. Okay. Now Right, Azure, uh, it's not even deprecated, it's retired, right? Yeah, I think, I think of, uh, as a Support started in February. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, so. Recommendations on migrating off of Azure RM automatically? Okay, uh, you know, I, I haven't got that question for a long time because people kind of moved away from Azure M for a long time. So. Yeah. You're right. So the thing is that first, you cannot run Azure PowerShell and Azure RM PowerShell in the same session at the same time. That's the first thing that you need to uh, avoid. If there is any reason to run still Azure RM, then my suggestion is always install Azure RM in Windows PowerShell and install Azure PowerShell in PowerShell 7. So they are separated by versions of PowerShell, okay? So they cannot influence themselves, okay? Uh, Microsoft tried to provide some migrations from Azure RM to uh, Azure PowerShell. I haven't looked at it for a long time, so I don't know how the current state uh, looks like. The first thing that they uh, did is that uh, for testing the things, you should enable the aliases, 
that will bring the Azure RM aliases to the new environment so that you can rerun Azure RM scripts if you have them. That was kind of the first thing. And they tried to create a, a module migration tool that run or a migration extension for Visual Studio Code. I tried it without a full success, to be honest. No? A lot of things kind of a, were left desired in, in that experience. I haven't tried it. I don't know if there is a new version of that migration tool. The Damian uh, Caro, the uh, PM for Azure PowerShell, will be here. Uh, he has a session. So uh, he's the best person to answer that question and to tell you like how things are going. But if you have anything with the Azure RM, go away from that, right? So that's that's the thing because uh, that version of uh, commands were stopped development, I think, like a four years, three years ago. So that means that they don't support any changes in Azure from the, <laughs> those days up to now, right? So I don't know really how capable they are even, really, right? But he's the best guy to, to answer that question, right? I'm feeling sorry for you that you need to deal with Azure RM. Seriously, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's so old. Yes. There's a um, uh, easy tools, easy dot tools of migration PowerShell module that I was able to use very successfully. Successfully? Awesome. Migrating Great. Azure RM to Great. Was it that the extension of Visual Studio Code was based on that module, right? Possibly. I, I think so. Just module without uh, being uh, okay. Good. Because uh, uh, I tried it. Well, I was part of the kind of a beta testing the extension and, and doing those those things and kind of a, you point it to a folder when you have all the scripts with Azure R RM and then uh, you hope for the best. But if you were successful, no reason that uh, he will not be, right? So <laughs> it's good that that module exists. Uh, so another thing that it's uh, important to, to mention is that uh, what happened with the uh, Azure PowerShell is that uh, for commands that are working with the uh, Entra ID, you know, Azure AD, former Azure AD, they changed the way how they work behind the scenes. And now all those uh, AZ AD commands are based on Microsoft Graph API. That was a huge change. And both Azure CLI and Azure PowerShell now using Microsoft Graph API for working with the Enter ID users, groups, applications, service principles, administrative units, and so on. So they are not, um, and there is no plan to support everything that exists in Enter ID. They support only the things that are needed for Azure commands to and Azure resources to work properly, okay? So if someone expects that the AZAD commands will support everything in Entra ID, that will not happen, okay? Just be aware of that. But the change to Microsoft Graph is really interesting because then they needed to play by the rules of the Microsoft Graph API, which was really different and is different than the Azure, Azure AD API. By the way, you know that uh, Azure AD module is now retired as of March 30th, yeah. you know that? Uh, that means that it's, uh, no, is it, did they say retired? No, it's a deprecated, it's a deprecated, sorry, big difference, deprecated, which means it still functions and it will function. I think that they released uh, just a week ago a new blog post when they, uh, explain the differences between deprecation and retirement. And they say that it will be retired, which means that at that point will practically stop working in a year. So next March, I think, will be kind of a, the dead end. Right now, we can still use it, but there will not be any new development on anything, only security fixes if the bugs are fine in that area, okay? But you are strongly encouraged to move to Microsoft Graph PowerShell. It's not an easy task at all. Anyone who 
tells you that it's easy, is lying to you, like badly. <laughs> Trust me uh, on, on that. And uh, that, that change is, is really needed as fast as, as possible, really, right? You don't want to wait for the next year to do that change. Doesn't matter how many scripts you have. Is it Microsoft Graph PowerShell? Microsoft Graph PowerShell. Those are, that's a, a, a set of PowerShell modules under that umbrella name, Microsoft Graph PowerShell, that works with the Microsoft Graph API to support different services in Microsoft 365, including Entra ID. Okay? So the whole Microsoft Graph is based on the, that API, and they are auto-generated, those commands. And that's one of the reasons why they are not the same quality as the kind of handcrafted commands when uh, you have a human touch at the end, right? So I like to call Microsoft uh, Graph PowerShell as uh, developer friendly compared to, let's say, Azure PowerShell today, which is user friendly. And I will actually give you one example so that you can see a difference, how it looks like when something is created just to, with a focus on uh, API. And another example in uh, Azure PowerShell, when you see commandlet and how it works, and then you realize that's something that is built with the user in mind. You know? How the user experience will be when they start using it. Okay, I have one example that will be very interesting for you, I hope. You know? Uh, one of the uh, things with uh, Azure CLI is that, uh, or Azure PowerShell, is that you would like to check the version of, of, a, of a tool that you use. And interestingly, for uh, AZ, Azure, Azure CLI, or AZ, you have two different ways uh, to do it. So one, one of them will give you this information if you run. AZ version, it will give you uh, information about the main tool and then uh, some of the extensions that I have on the system. But if you, if you run it with the parameter version like this, then it gives you a list of all the Services also, they are uh, kind of supported. Oh, they changed that. So it's kind of extended a little for this, but it gives you this important information uh, about the update and how far behind you are with the current version that you have, which is really cool information. So when you run it, they check the latest version. Say, so, oh, you are two versions behind. You can update, upgrade to that one, and you can actually run AZ upgrade. An AZ upgrade with update not just the core Azure CLI, but also all the extensions you have. Okay? Those extensions, again, are like a modules for PowerShell, right? So they are building those extensions to support some preview services. And those are not ready for a prime time, not for a GA, so they are adding it as extensions. One, when it's ready, they will include it in an Azure CLI installation. Right? Certain things like that are kind of in extensions for years now. And kind of they are fine with that. As AZ Interactive, that interactive is extension. But it's not covering any specific Azure service. And they think, like, why not keeping it that way? It's just extension. It runs on a side. It's when people are running it. It's something that it's not running in the CICDs. It's interactive, so it needs a user there as well, right? So they type AZ interactive. We will install it for a minute, and it will work kind of thing, right? So just to be aware about that terminology and, and how the, the updates are working for Azure CLI. When you do an upgrade in Azure CLI, do you do extensions like? No, no, no. That's, that's also an interesting difference. Thank you very much. So when you uh, update Azure CLI with this command, it will replace the version that you have, and you will get only the latest. The same thing goes 
with the installation with the Azure CLI with the MSI, which is one of the most common way to do it. Also, uh, I moved to Vinget installation. Do we have any users of a Vinget in the room? A couple. So Vinget is a Microsoft, uh, how would they call it properly? Manager? Pa package manager? Microsoft Package Manager. So I use Winget for installing a bunch of uh, tools now, and Azure CLI is one of them. Yeah. So everything that you need to do to install it is to run Winget Microsoft dot Azure CLI, and it will install uh, Azure CLI. Okay. So when you do it that way, it will also replace the old version. Yeah. With Azure PowerShell, when you install a new version, you still keep the old one, right? So you need to be aware that you are kind of keeping the old one. And my suggestion is always to have two versions, at least two versions of Azure PowerShell. Why? When you have a new one and you run your script, your old script or script that used to run perfectly with the previous version, and it stopped working, you still have the old version, and you can rerun it in that version. If, if it works in that one, that means something changed but you are not responsible. They introduce a change with a new version, and then you can open issue in Azure PowerShell GitHub repo. Right? So easiest way to test. Keep at least two versions, and then you can always test one of your scripts in case that it breaks in the latest one. So it always, uh, by default, it always uses the latest. But if you want to uh, specify one, then you will first import a version and say a required version is this. And then you will work with the version that you specified. And then you will test it in that one. Also, it's even easier to use containers for those kind of things, as I mentioned to you before. Every time when they release a breaking change, I suggest to you to change a container to rerun your scripts with a new version, to notice all the differences, potential uh, scripts that are breaking. And when they fail, make a notice, rerun them in the old environment with the older version, and then compare and see if difference, if you thought correctly that it was perfectly fine in the old version and it just breaks in a new one, or you probably didn't make it work anyway. <laughs> in the previous one, it breaks there as well. Because of some other reasons, not just the version of Azure PowerShell. Okay. To run it in a, in a container, uh, it, as I said, it's very kind of easy once when you install a Docker desktop on, a, on Windows. And a recommended way for that to, to use it uh, with the best performance is to also enable WSL and run it actually in a Linux distribution that comes with a WSL. It's a better performance than, you can run it without that, but it's just a better performance there if you do it that way. And then uh, they are hosting the container images, official container images for both Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI in Microsoft Container Registry. They used to have it in a Docker Hub, and I think that certain information is still available, but the actual uh, images are hosted now in a Microsoft Container Registry. Uh, they did that to kind of uh, improve security, have a better control uh, on things, okay? So that also changed the way how you uh, specify a link where the command Docker run should find the container image and pull it to your system, okay? So here is an experience for it. Here I am on my uh, Azure VM that has uh, a WSL and it has also Docker uh, installed on it. I pulled the images for Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI and some others. You will see what I have on a system. So MCR, Microsoft.com, Azure-PowerShell is the one that runs PowerShell in certain Linux distribution. Uh, I'm using here the tag latest 
and I don't care so much about distributions. But if you care about a certain distributions and the versions, you can specify that in a tags. I will show you how to get the list of tags. And then you can use it that way, right? Right here for the demo purposes, I'm just using latest, which is the same as if you don't mention any tags, okay? So to uh, run it, you need to say Docker run, run it interactively. Uh, we can run it as a service, but I want to run it interactively for you. And I want to remove the container once when I exit a container because I don't want to kind of have those uh, trails. And then uh, it's kind of hard to look at the keyboard because of a light. I cannot see what I'm typing actually, which is a little bit weird. Okay, so if I run it, now I'm in a container that runs Azure PowerShell. The only thing that I need to do to execute commands against Azure is to authenticate to Azure, okay? To authenticate to Azure, command is a AZ login, as you know, and what I did on this system is that I enable a system assigned manage identity on this Azure VM. And I assign permissions to that identity so that I don't need to uh, say anything else but just not dash dash, this is for Azure CLI, just one. Oh, sorry, I made a mistake. I said I'm on a PowerShell and then I type Azure CLI command. Connect AZ account. So now I'm authenticated. As you can see, I'm not authenticated as Alexander. I'm authenticated with that system assigned managed identity. And now I can run get AZVM and get access to it and run any of those commands that the permissions are allowing me to do from this environment. Is this good? And I have full control on so the versions that I'm using here. I'm typing it a little bit shorter. It's the latest version of Azure PowerShell. Why? Because I pulled the latest image just five days ago. The latest container image contained the latest version of Azure PowerShell, which is 11.5, okay? If I want to run Azure CLI command, what I need to do is this. And then easy login, identity. And now I am authenticated to Azure from Azure CLI. And I can run command from here. Let's compare and do the same thing here. List VMs in Azure and format them as a table. Dash O is a short way for dash dash output because by default, JSON is default output in Azure CLI. We'll talk about that soon, and I'm getting a list of that, okay? Very easy way with just pulling the containers and then running it with a full control on the versions that I can use, and here we can see that version should be 2.59, which is the latest version of Azure CLI as well. Oh. Any questions? So that's kind of a way to work with the containers. And the uh, Azure command line tools, uh, one thing that it's uh, important here, for example, if you have locally on your machine established SSH as a way to uh, authenticate to your VMs and you will need those keys, then you can uh, bring that to a container in a way that when you start uh, container, you will specify as a volume, a folder that contains your keys. And you will mount them to a proper folder called root.ssh in a container. It will be visible to the Azure CLI in it, and you will continue to work in the same way as you did locally. You will do the same for local folders that contain your scripts. You don't want to store things in a container. You want to store things that you want to keep outside of container. 
locally on a host. And then you will just mount the folder that contains all those scripts that you needed. And so you will see how that will work because with a uh, little bit more detail with a cloud shell because I will show you how you can run a cloud shell as a container locally on your machine. It's created as a managed service, but there is a way to run it locally on your machine as well. And you get all the benefits of pre-installation of hundreds of tools for working with Azure without thinking about all of them. You just get one huge container image. It's seriously huge. Right now, it's 11 gigabytes. It's that big, ridiculous size. So the, the longest part of every, setting everything up is just to pull that and then extract that image on your machine because those 11 gigabytes <laughs> need some time. So that's, this is really, running those things in containers is really super useful. And uh, uh, those are two links when you can find information about the Azure CLI and Azure PowerShell container images. Uh, I needed some time actually to find it out because uh, they're kind of uh, not advertising so much that there is a way from a browser to get to that information. I don't know why they're doing it that way. But something's happening here. So this is how it looks like. This is the home of the official Azure PowerShell container image in Microsoft Container Registry. Okay, You get that information about all the different versions. They call it artifacts here because kind of idea behind Azure Container Registry is not just to put and host containers there, but some other artifacts as well. So they have those Docker images there. And when you kind of pick one of them, you get some information and the actual command that can pull that container image to your machine. Okay. So you have that for uh, Azure CLI as well. But unfortunately, not for Azure Cloud Shell. Uh, it's not under the same kind of link. If I say here Azure Dash Cloud Shell, it will give me 404. No, so this is for Azure CLI. If you're familiar with the Docker Hub, this is kind of a Microsoft uh, way to mimic that kind of thing. So for us, instead of going to a browser, there is a way to uh, get an information from PowerShell as a, with, with a code, OK? So uh, we need to change uh, a URL when we need to uh, get the information from. So it's uh, version 2 Azure CLI tags list. And then we will use invoke REST method to get the information. And then we will just uh, get, look at the tags, OK? So if I do this, so now the let me clear screen. Tags variable contains the list of all available versions that we have in a system, OK, that you can get. You would be interested in the latest one. So you will think, OK, let me sort that and then select the first 10. And you will see, because they are not just numbers, right? Uh, it's kind of hard to, to look at it and, and see what's, what's happening. But there is one uh, little trick that you can do is you can cast it to a version which will remove uh, all the, and with the silently continue, I will remove the errors when it complains when there are letters, not just numbers there. But give me just numbers, but the sorting will actually work and I will get information about the latest version. So that's a, a kind of a cool trick with the version to get that the latest one is 5.59. This is like a quick and dirty fix for things to get information about. If I said not 10, just give me one, I will get the latest version that it's supported. And immediately I will know, OK, there is one that it's there because they also release it. Every time when they release a new version on a GitHub repo, they also uh, build all the containers as well. You don't need to wait for it. right? So they are immediately available to you, which is just awesome. Really great. Azure Cloud Shell. Now, Azure Cloud Shell, as I say, is a hosted environment for running Azure PowerShell, Azure CLI, and all the other command line tools connected to Azure in browser. Okay, That's the main goal. 
And uh, usually people get there because they go to a portal and they click on this button next to a co-pilot. And when you do it for the first time, it says it's not set up. You need to uh, create a storage account and a sh file share on that storage account because they want to store configs and your scripts and all of that in that environment so that the next time you start Cloud Shell, you get the same environment from file system point of view. You will get a new container assigned to you, but you will get access to all the things that you created in the past and configured in the past, okay? There is a rumor that they will build, but I still haven't got it, so-called ephemeral Cloud Shell when you will not get access to a storage. So you want to have something that you will just run things, but you are not uh, configuring things for the next, ver uh, next session. You are not saving scripts or anything. You're just running interactively certain things. You get this environment very quickly. No storage account, no string is attached, and bam, 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 you just run things. You get results, and, and things are created there. So here, by default, it starts to the one that you pick, and later it starts to the last shell environment that you used, PowerShell or Bash. So right now I'm here in Bash, and uh, we can check the version that it's supported now here, and it's the same one. So, so uh, this version is released a couple of uh, weeks ago, and now uh, they updated the container image that supports Cloud Shell as well. You always need to expect a couple of weeks delay between the release of Azure CLI, Azure PowerShell, and updates to the uh, Cloud Shell container image. Why? Because they always wait a little for a feedback for customers. They're monitoring the issues in a GitHub repo and all of that. And when they think, okay, no big uh, fixes are needed or anything, we can just kind of build a new image. They will build a new image and start the rollout. Uh, the rollout is not happening to the globally, to the every single user immediately at the same time. So there is, uh, you can expect delays. So for example, uh, I can get it a week later than you, right? Because for some reason they pick your region to do the rollout first, right? So don't be surprised with that. Don't expect that it will happen immediately to uh, you, especially if you're working in a, a global company. Not all the branches will get access to the same, uh, on the same time. Right, they, they need some time to do it. So you have access, you get access to, uh, to it uh, from, from here. As I said, you can go to Bash or PowerShell experience from a portal, but also uh, you can get it uh, just typing PWSH, and then I will move to a PowerShell experience. And in a PowerShell shell, now I can use both Azure CLI and Azure PowerShell, okay? Uh, I will not spend, more time kind of going through all the options here that are uh, available to you, but one of them that it's uh, uh, kind of cool is that the file share that supports storing your uh, files is uh, available here. And there is one thing that it's uh, absolutely brilliant is that we can actually mount this file share as a network share. So if you are on a Windows laptop, for example, then you can create new PS drive kind of thing and, and have access to uh, all the files in a cloud shell like they are mapped network share on premises that we have. You don't even need to know the code to do that. If you click on a connect button here, you will get all the code for all three supported operating systems, Windows, Linux, and Mac. So for Windows, you can even pick, for example, the drive ladder that is available to you right now. And then you say, I want to use a authentication method, storage account key or entra, and then show script and you get a script. And you just need to copy and this is the, even the button for copy <laughs> this script. Once when you copy this script to your clipboard, uh, just be uh, careful to open non-elevated PowerShell and then run it in a non-elevated PowerShell. Because if you run it in an 
elevated PowerShell, it will succeed, but you won't see it in a file explorer. Because file explorer cannot show you elevated stuff. Okay? So just be aware of that. Run it as a standard user and mount it as a standard user, and it will be available to you. Okay? What we will do is uh, we will actually use a code from here when there is a way to run this cloud shell as a local container. At first, Microsoft didn't provide container image for cloud shell, okay? And they, they did. And they did that for a year or so, and then they stopped and said, so like, build it yourself. And they gave us some code that we could use to build it by ourselves. But then uh, community put some pressure, me included, to kind of give us back the easiest way to do it. Then we can just, the same with the Azure CLI and Azure PowerShell containers, we can just pull a container image for a cloud shell and we will get it locally, okay? So that sounds like a, like a good idea to us. So what we did is uh, we kind of asked them, asked them, asked them, and they did. So back to this environment here, if I repeat this command to give me the list of images on my system, you might see now that the second one is Azure Cloud Shell, okay? And the size of it is 11.8 gigabytes extracted, okay? So the thing is, this container now contains all the tools that are part of the Cloud Shell experience, but it's missing some of the benefits of running Cloud Shell in a browser managed by Microsoft. So one of the first things that they did for us providing that service is if you are authenticated to a portal, then when you start your Cloud Shell, you are immediately authenticated to tools. So you don't need to rerun connect AZ account, AZ login. Terraform was pre-authenticated with certain code and stuff, right? So the point was like, if I'm already in a portal and I'm authenticated to Azure in a portal, then all those tools should just work without authentication part. So this is not something that you get here because you here get just a container that contains tools, okay? That's one of the things. Another thing is, by default, I don't have access to my Azure Cloud file share, right? I don't have access to my files that I created in a, in a Cloud Shell, which is a bummer, right? So the thing is, can we fix that? What do you think? So what is, what is the first things that we need to do? We need to pull the image, and this is already done, okay? So what is the second thing that we need to do? Yeah, so the thing is to, to fix, to make it easier for authentication, I will just do the thing that I've shown you before with Azure CLI and Azure PowerShell. I will leverage the system assigned managed identity on a host because this container is also aware of that. So to make it easier for myself, I will just say Azure CLI dash dash identity or connect AZ account dash identity inside of the cloud shell container and that will work for me. What about files? How can I get access to the Cloud Shell files? Sorry? Exactly. So I will mount the file share to this host and then start the container mounting that file share to the container. And I will get access to that inside of a container. Isn't that awesome? with all those tools. So what I need to do is 
instead of typing all of that, let me see if I have it already. Yeah. So the code for mounting a file share is the one that I got from Portal. I just copy pasted that. The only uh, difference that you need to be aware, of, which is not mentioned, is that you need to do this first. You need SIF utils. Without that, it will not work. So you need to add that first to your host. OK? And in this case, the host is Ubuntu distribution in WSL, Windows Subsystem for Linux, okay? the one that I'm using for all containers. So I'm running this first. And after that, all of this code is coming from a portal. I don't even need to know what it's doing, to be honest. Okay. Once when I have that, this is what I run. Docker run, dash volume, and then it's mounted as mount. And then this is the name, demo shell 2020 share. That's the name of my file share that supports Cloud Shell in a browser. And I'm mapping that to a root cloud drive. Why? Because when I'm in a Cloud Shell originally, the things that should be preserved from a session to session goes to the Cloud Drive folder. So I want to mimic that. But I could use any folder in a container that I liked. But I just wanted to kind of, a, because I'm, I will work there as a root user in a folder Cloud Drive, right? So that's something that I did. And then we have this run interactively, remove it at the end, calling that. And then I can say at the end, do I want to start it in a bash or in PowerShell? Although I can change it later when I'm inside of it, OK? So now I will start it in a, in a bash. And now I'm in a, in a bash, OK? AZ version, just to check. Should be the same as the one that I've shown you in the browser, OK? If everything is, is uh, OK, if they updated that image to be consistent with the image used for the service, OK? If I want to run things in a PowerShell, I just start PowerShell inside of this Cloud Shell and now in the PowerShell, OK? So if I want to go now to, uh, let me do it this way, root cloud drive. I can use Linux command in a PowerShell shell because I'm on Linux. Those are more my cloud shell files. Those are the same files that are available to me in a browser, running right now, mounted in this container. So if I do, a, uh, OK, I think that I can, I can create new item, right? That would be a PowerShell way to do it. And then uh, file hello from PSH Summit 24. And then say that. Uh, was it type is a file, right? So if I, it should be somewhere here, right? Hello from partial summit 24. And I go back here to um, Cloud Shell. And let's go to a Cloud Shell here. And let me see where I am. Mass Cloud Drive. Hello from PowerShell Summit 24. So I can work locally in a Cloud Shell and everything that I created there, all the scripts, reports, whatever I'm doing, will be visible from a browser as well. No? Because it's the same file share in a storage account, right? Great experience, right? It's just brilliant how that works. And what's even, uh, I think that, yeah, I still have five minutes, right? Uh, a great way to, to work with all this is when you go to a Visual Studio Code and you want to connect to a Cloud Shell 
and you have here Azure Cloud Shell with a Bash experience or a PowerShell experience. And it gives you access to the same environment. So now you work here in a Cloud Shell as a terminal inside of Visual Studio Code. And everything that you have here that you run, let me see something that I can actually run, AZ version, run selection. It went over wire to the Cloud Shell and executed it. I see that here. Just, just amazing how that works. So any kind of Azure CLI, Azure PowerShell code or any of those command line tools supported in Cloud Shell are now freely available in the editor and they can run in the Cloud Shell as a terminal there, right? Or if you start Windows Terminal, then one of the available terminals is Azure Cloud Shell. So if you click on Azure Cloud Shell, you build a tenant that you already have. They will request the Cloud Shell and then you will have access to a Cloud Shell from a terminal. And you can use that to work with stuff. Right? Options, options, options. But that's always good. You might be confused right now if you haven't used it before with so many different ways to use it, but you will pick one that works for you. All right, right? And then you can use that one. No? Nice way to work with all that and to have it kind of a centralized managed by Microsoft there with those locally running tools with access to it. No? Pretty cool thing. Any questions? Did you like it so far? No? Yes. Cool. Okay, so let's have a break and I will see you in half an hour. So I think one of the things that it's really super useful here is that way of mounting that file share so that you can actually continue working with the same files and stuff in a different environments. That's kind of a cool thing. You don't need to do syncing by yourself because there is a way to upload and download files to Cloud Shell in a browser experience, but allows you to upload only one file but if you have a kind of a bunch of scripts that you want to bring to that environment, then it's much easier for you to kind of mount the file share as a network share, and then just put everything that you want there. It will be immediately visible to you in uh, different environments in, in a browser, right? So it's easier to work with a bunch of files than just like uploading one by one, and they go to a specific folder. You cannot even change that during uploading process, but you need to move them later. It's kind of a just pain in the ass. Not, not that good experience. OK, so uh, this is what we did already. All those things. There, I promise you to show you how you can get the, the tags for a Cloud Shell container. OK, I'm running this where? For some reason, it didn't go. OK, I think that the Cloud Shell timed out. That's something that I haven't mentioned. If you haven't tried it before, I, there is a timeout of 20 minutes. So if Cloud Shell is idle for 20 minutes, then it will uh, time out and you need to reconnect. Uh, I don't think that they changed that to make it configurable. Although people kind of requested that, but I, I think that it's still 20 minutes because the main reason why it exists, it's not to run long running scripts, it's to be there to work interactively, okay? For long, long running stuff, you will go with the Azure Automation Service, for example, and run it as a RAM books there, not in, in, in a Cloud Shell. So let me try to rerun this locally here, yeah. So those are all the, the versions of Cloud Shell container image in Microsoft Container Registry that exist for you. So it looks like they are kind of use them for testing certain things and they have some phases there. But one of them that is kind of the latest that I found is this one, right? 2024, 22nd of March, right? That's pretty new. So that's the practically the latest one that you will use. And uh, you can also uh, check that if you go to a browser to, uh, to a Cloud Shell. Let me just show you that, that if you are 
Let me see if I'm still here. Yeah. So if you run env to get a list of uh, environmental variables in Linux, there is one called ACC version, and it tells you that this version is from 29th of March this year. This is how you check the version of image. This is how you, when you submit issue, if something's wrong, they will ask you for this. Because I told you the rollout needs some time, so certain people can have a different version just right now. Okay? So this is how you check. And if you are kind of a confused, why is it an ACC? Because the working name for Azure Cloud Shell was Azure Cloud Console, ACC. That's every time when you see ACC, that's Cloud Shell, okay? They didn't change that because usually that happens, right? They have a working name, which is usually pretty fine, but then someone calls the marketing, said you need to get your payment, <laughs> deserve your payment. You need to do some work and they say, like, okay, let's call it Azure Cloud Shell. <laughs> and then they change that, but they don't change it in code. You see that all the time, right? And also for, for the Linux distribution, as I told you, now the official brand is Azure Linux, but you will actually see CBL Mariner when you go a little bit deeper in a system and you kind of look at the code and all that stuff. So be aware that's the same thing. They just rebranded it because, you know, marketing. That's how it works. Okay, so uh, that was the part of like, how can you also check the version of, of container uh, things and stuff. So this is one thing that I will go a little bit faster because uh, as I told, I will share all the code with you, but I wanted to just share this part with you that uh, there is a difference how we deal with the secrets in a, in a PowerShell and uh, in a Bash or in an Azure CLI when we work with it. We are trained in Azure PowerShell and, and PowerShell itself to work with the secure strings, right? And very often when the parameter is a password or some kind of a secret, what is expected is a sec secure string type of object, right? In Azure CLI, when they have a, a password, they expect a plain text, okay? It's a bad idea to type that plain text password. Why? User error. Not user error. I mean, that's always a problem. Even when you work with the secure strings, you build them, and, and user error is a problem. Uh, obvious error can be, uh, obvious problem can be someone behind your back over your shoulder kind of thing. But when you type a plain text password in a shell, that goes in a history, right? That's not a good thing. When those plain text passwords are logged in. Sorry? Uh, I'm not sure about that. I, I'm more worried that it will kind of a, stay in the log files. So if you are working in a PowerShell as a shell, then the PS read line module is responsible for storing things in a history. You know that? So you have one history that is history for a session, and then that you have that history file that every single session is storing things, okay? They improve the PS read line, so the PS read line is now aware of a certain keywords, and those lines will not be logged, okay? Secrets, passwords, connection strings, and certain things will trigger not to store and put those things in a history files. I'm not aware if the bash history has similar capability, I doubt. So it's always a problem when you type. And I was always puzzled why is that the case that the people from Linux ecosystem are, are not kind of a freaking out because those plain text passwords are kind of a easy to use there and, and everybody is using them. And I asked them like, if you are prompted in a browser during your browsing session to specify your credentials and when you start typing your password and that password is visible, you will freak out, right? Because you are trained to see it behind the asterisk, right? But if it's visible, it's a problem. But when we are in a shell, no one complains that it's not hidden from us. 
right? We just type it and it's just there, right? Isn't that strange? And they told me like, yeah, but uh, if someone already gets that log file, I'm already in a big problem. But it's like, that's not the case because it's one thing when they get credentials for your local machine and a local admin, and another if they get credentials for your global admin that you use for accessing Azure, right? That's not the same kind of jeopardy, right? And people very easily do that without kind of worrying stuff, right? And the way how cross-platform PowerShell treats secure string is, is also kind of a changed how that used to be with Windows, right? So it's kind of a tricky situation and, and the best possible way to kind of deal with secrets, and I see more and more people using that, but still lots of people are not using that, is to use first secrets management module in PowerShell and to use Azure Key Vault. And even better, to use federated tokens if it's possible so that you don't deal with the passwords at all. I will show you an example that the best possible way to run things in a GitHub Actions is actually to use the federated tokens when, when there is no passwords. So that's, that's the thing really, right? But here is the one thing that you will get sometimes a secure string and you will need to convert that secure string into a string so that you can use it with Azure CLI. So from a practical point of view, what is the easiest way to do that? Okay, so first let me, let me get a secure string. So one of the ways is to kind of read host if I work, sorry, if I work interactively with things and I will type some password and uh, where am I? if I change now the password variable contains a secure string, okay? So the, the easy, one of the ways that you can find, but this is two lines of code that I cannot remember, doesn't matter how smart I am or not, I cannot remember these two lines. Can you? And, and kind of keeping them somewhere on the side, which I did in the sticky notes, seriously, <laughs> for, for years, I kept them there because they will give me conversion from secure string to a plain text, right? But then I found the easiest possible way, I think, with a system net network credential type, it has a static method called new. When you pass a, a dummy user, empty strings, and that secure string password, and you ask for a password, and you get a plain text. So this is much easier to remember, or what you need to remember actually is just the name of the type. System net network credential. You don't even need the system. Net network credential is enough. Colon, colon, new. If you run that, you will get this. And you will recognize here that this one here will convert and give you plain text. Just passing a dummy user and a secure string asking for a password. So that's probably the easiest way to get the plain text, which is needed by Azure CLI, right? I don't know if you, if you have any experience, but uh, the secrets, secret management module works really nice with a key vault, okay? So the, the thing that you need to do once when you install the module itself and uh, here, if we look at the, for tag secret management in a PowerShell uh, gallery, you will see there is a bunch of different modules that support that to give you access to the passwords and secrets in different systems. Some of those are those password managers that are known, but also the one that nicely work with uh, all of that is a key vault and support is uh, just there. So what you need to do is, uh, Let's say we have a key vault called GitHub key vault, KV. We need to get a reference to the key vault, and then we need to get a reference to the name and the subscription ID. So this is what I did with these three lines of code here. 
And after that, we need to register that secret vault that points to the key vault using the vault name and subscription ID as the parameters. Once when I do that, I specify the name that I want. In this case, is AZ Kiwi. Okay? So secret info pointing to that key vault will give me a list of secrets that I have stored there. And to use them, I need a commandlet called get secret, which is part of the secret management module. So I say get secret, the name of one of the secrets. It's called my secret name, pointing to a vault. And then I get information that it's a secure string. And this is why I, yeah, I will use it like this. If my next command need a secure string, if the next command need a plain text, you just need to add parameter, switch parameter as plain text. And it will be returned as a plain text. And you will use that. OK? So you're not storing anything locally on your machine. You very nicely use it locally here, but it's all stored in a key vault. Right? Excellent way to do it. If you need it as a secure string, it's available. If you need it as a plain text, it's available with just one parameter. Okay. Uh, here we have an example that I will not execute stuff when I'm just comparing uh, Azure CLI and Azure PowerShell commands. And uh, I want to show you that very often those commands are practically identical when you look at the parameters. We talk about that syntax of like verb dash noun, which is here a group, subgroup, and a command kind of thing. But then the parameters are practically the same. If you can see when, when we uh, create a storage account, I kind of organize things that you can see that it's practically the same. If you know PowerShell and how to do it in PowerShell, you will immediately know how to do that in Azure CLI as well. But sometimes there are differences, right? Sometimes there are differences in a way how they output things. It's not just the format. The PowerShell outputs objects. The Azure CLI outputs, by default, JSON strings, JSON ob object. But uh, it's not just that. But also, sometimes the error messages are different, or those helper information is a little bit different. So the, here is one example, very recent, when they change the uh, image names for VMs that you can use. In uh, Azure CLI, you get very useful error message that says it's an invalid name to use Ubuntu LTS. That's not supported anymore. Uh, use the custom ones or pick one of those. And they give you a list of all the supported uh, image names. That's much better than what you get in Azure PowerShell when it says cannot find image Ubuntu LTS. Right. So you don't know why, what's the reason, what can I do instead of that. In Azure CLI, it's much better. Or sometimes what, what happens, and this is a very interesting case here, that uh, in Azure PowerShell, they will uh, create a commandlet that behaves differently uh, depending on the parameters, usually switch parameters that you will specify, when in Azure CLI, they will create absolutely two different commands. So in Azure PowerShell, if you want to stop machine, and you run stop AZVM, the machine will be deallocated by default. Okay, If you want it to stay provisioned so that you will keep the IP address, for example, you will say uh, stay provisioned. But you will use the same stop AZVM. In Azure CLI, they created two different commands. The AZVM stop there actually uh, stops machines but keeps it provisioned, which is unexpected for PowerShell users. If you really want to deallocate, you need to use AZVM deallocate. Right? So that's one of the differences that can actually cost you money. right? Because you will use Azure VM stop thinking that you are stopping a machine, but you will be still charged for things because you are not deallocate machine. Right? So just be careful for a couple of those things. This is one that actually cost you money, so this is why I'm kind of pointing to that one. I see some environments where people thought for months 
that they kind of deallocated everything and then they were kind of surprised with the bill. <laughs> yep, it happens. So now we are getting to the uh, part that it's probably uh, the hardest for uh, using, I need to move this, to use uh, Azure CLI. Uh, it's about uh, the output that uh, comes, which is a, a JSON, and then how to deal and with the JSON uh, strings that are coming to you and fetch just the properties and information that you really need. To that, you need to learn a new query language. It's called James Pod Query. But the first thing is that when we talk about the output and the difference between the output uh, of Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI, in Azure PowerShell, what we get is an object, right? And in Azure CLI, it's by default a JSON. You can change that output in uh, Azure CLI and say dash dash output or short dash O, and then format it as a table or a colored uh, JSON or a YAML or TSV, which is a uh, tab separated value kind of thing. And there is one thing that is really interesting. There is option to uh, output none. Why do you think that's useful? when you want to prevent Azure CLI to output anything. Uh, the case why they created that is sometimes you will create an Azure resource that as a part of the output, outputs secrets. And you don't want those secrets to get in the output because if system is configured that way, those things will go into logs, okay? So just because you don't see the output doesn't mean that something is wrong with the creation of resource. Resource is perfectly fine, he's created all right, but you just don't get back that output and you don't see it. Just be aware of that. And there is also a possibility in both Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI to do some kind of a global configuration things when you know, for example, that you will work on a certain resource group for a long time, resources that belong to the same resource group for a long time, you can define a default resource group and you don't need to then specify it for any commands that you will use, okay? Or if you're not happy in Azure CLI that the JSON is default output, you can change default output to be table instead of saying dash O table every single time. But if you think that Default value none is kind of a cool thing twice, okay? That's not something to be set by default because you might then forget about it and then you will be confused like why I'm, I'm not getting any outputs for things right away. So just be careful there. But there is a cool way to do it. One of the uh, easy interactive ways to configure Azure CLI is to run a command called az init and then it will ask you questions about how you want to configure your environment. And you can do that for interactive usage or for automation, or you can go value by value and answer for every single one of them what you want to set. And you can do uh, with a similar command, but not in an interactive way as far as I know, in Azure PowerShell as well, and specify default location or default resource group or not to show warning messages for breaking changes or some of those things. Microsoft is right now, uh, after my request, looking at options to actually uh, document all the things that you can change and, and set up with those things because they can be changed in a configuration files or they can be changed with environmental variables. So uh, it's important to understand what are the environmental variables that are available when we work with those systems because they will change how the system behaves. And you would like to know how you can control that as well, right? Maybe you are not happy to send telemetry data to Microsoft, right? But that's enabled by default, right? Or you look at the Cloud Shell environment variables and you will find something that is specific for a Cloud Shell and then changes the way how Cloud Shell behaves. And you might say like, oh, some of those things are cool to have on my own system. And you will then set up the environmental variables there, right? So right now they're documenting all of them because right now 
there is no single document with all of them. They're just kind of spread around different documents and help files and, uh, and all of that. So that would be kind of a cool to get. So one of the things is that because the JSON output is default output for Azure CLA commands, and you would like to fetch just a specific information from it, not all of that, uh, they needed a new query language called James Pot Query that is a query language for JSON strings. And it has its own rules. So it's just like another query language that we need to learn to get what we want. So one of the things that you need to understand is that uh, CLI can output a dictionary when you have those key value pairs, or it can output array. Depending on that, we need to use different syntax to fetch the data. So if the command is always returning a single object, then it returns a dictionary. If it can return one or more, then it always returns array. Even if it's a one, it will return array, just because it can contain more, okay? And depending on array or on dictionaries, there is a different syntax to fetching the properties, which is a little bit confusing, but this is how things work there, okay? And we will start here with, uh, with a dictionary. So one of the examples of that is when you run AZVM show, which is just like give me details about a single VM, right? I'm not listing a bunch of them. I want details about just single one of them. Because it's one of them, that means the output will be a dictionary, which you will see here as a pairs of keys, tags, and then value, time created, and value, and type. We are not interested in everything here just to show, but you see it's a dictionary. So now we need to get to the information here, and every single commandlet, no commandlet, command in Azure CLI support a dash dash query parameter, every single one of them. So the way how we fetch data, fetch a property from a dictionary, is to get a reference to the tag, and then for the nested ones, we will go with the dot, and then the next uh, key, and the next key. So for example, here, I'm going a little bit deeper into OS profile, Windows configuration, enable automatic updates, and what I will get as an output will be just true, okay? So I got a single value here for this. One of the most problematic things here is that you need to be aware <laughs> those tags need to be case sensitive, which is hard, right? So if I here use capital letter for O, I will not get anything, right? So in PowerShell, what is the casing that it's used? Do you know that name? When every single word, in every single word, the first letter is capitalized. How we call that kind of casing? Pascal casing, okay? Here in Azure and in a JSON, different casing is used when the first word is with a small letter, small case. That one is called camel case. Okay, be aware of that. So very frequently, when you look at documentation, you will see that they're even calling variables using a camel case in Azure CLI. Even, even I've seen it actually even in a PowerShell. I think everything comes from a JSON because JSON is kind of a behind everything. So even in a, in a PowerShell documentation, very frequently I see now that they are using camel casing for naming variables, okay? But any time when something is case sensitive, that's another problem for users, right? No. It's a shame that it's like that, but it is, and we need to kind of uh, pay attention to that part. There's also, this is the, uh, the syntax that we use for getting a single value. But you, when you want to get more than one value, then inside of, the, inside of that string, you need to uh, go with the square brackets. This is the operator called multi-select value. 
right? So this is what we have here for getting name and then admin user. And when, when we go with the, with the square brackets, what we get as a output is an array. But if we are not happy, if we want a dictionary as a, as a result, then we need to change the syntax and use uh, curly brackets or braces. That also allows us to rename things. Okay, so instead of uh, for this case, in, uh, because I'm not changing the formatting, I'm, I'm going with the JSON. You will see just the output changes, right? So now it's a dictionary. We have pairs, keys and value, keys and value. When keys are defined by me, and if I change the output to table, that will become the header. Okay. So you will see how PowerShell can actually help you with that if you use PowerShell as a shell to kind of change uh, things because as you can see, this very quickly becomes quite complex and we are just scratching the surface of the possibilities of doing this. Yes, your question. Why is the order being changed? Why the, uh, is his order? So when it uh, outputs a dictionary, then a uh, dictionary is unordered uh, key value pairs, okay? And, and you don't have a control on that. Similar, you remember in a PowerShell that when we work with a hash table, the hash table, if it's not ordered, it will also change randomly the order of a key value pairs, but people complain about that and they, they added that decorator ordered to preserve the order that they have. Also in PowerShell, because you are referencing to the names of the properties, that's not really important, but people were OCDs, they really wanted the order that they want, <laughs> you know, like, so they put a little bit of effort to do that. Uh, okay, I see some typo here. Okay, uh, so here in the next example, I have a, way how to get a property from array. Because from a dictionary, there was one syntax. From an array, it's a different syntax. And in array, the thing is that we need to do the flattening first. This is the syntax for flattening array. And then we can uh, specify the properties that we want. And you will see that very often what they're doing, they're using this uh, braces syntax to change also the names of the properties because very often uh, if in the nested ones you need to go deep instead of going with that you will just go with the os sorry it will now change things i made a mistake os right if you want to rename or make it shorter to use it later for for something that's uh, the the way how you do it and You see now that we are getting arrays of uh, smaller JSON objects that contain only three uh, properties. We have now here arrays of the three dictionaries when we have those combinations of our names and the values that are coming from a, from a system. The thing that you need to be aware here is that if you try to get information uh, just using the values from it without using uh, this syntax that it's kind of a troublesome for me because you always think that you are doing something redundant before, because you are repeating the things that are there already, just maybe case, uh, changing a casing. If you do it without that, you will get here a table that doesn't have proper information. It gives you just generic column one, column two, column three, which is not good, right? We cannot work with that. So we need actually to give this, even if it's just repetition of location, location. And the thing is that if you do it for one, then you need to do it for every single one. Otherwise, you will get an error. You cannot just rename a single property and leave the other ones unchanged, right? That's one of the limitations of, of uh, the whole uh, query language they have, but this is what it is. So here we have location, group, and name, right? So we have are defined headers for things. Uh, one thing that it's 
quite interesting to me is that, uh, as you know, in PowerShell, they always try to create commandlets that are good with the one thing, right? So we have one for sorting. We have one for filtering, where object, sort object, one for selecting properties, select object, right? Here they're trying to do multiple things inside of the same syntax, making that syntax quite complex. So the thing that is quite easy in PowerShell, if you ask me, get az location, select object. Something's bad happening here without me doing anything. <laughs> this is PS3 line. We will see if it continues to work. Uh, get az location, pipe to select object, display name, and location, and then sort by display name, right? That's for anyone who spent more than one day with PowerShell, this is kind of easy to understand what's happening and to write itself, right? Not, not a kind of a big thing, really. So when you run this, you will see that I will get in the output display name and location properties, and they will be sorted. So it will end with a W. Remember that the last three are double, uh, West US, US3, and, and two and three, OK? Remember that. So now for as a CLI to accomplish the same, what we need to do is we need to uh, do the, this flattening part first that we talk about, but then we need to uh, use a sort by and then specify the name of the property that we we'll, we'll sort by things, which is a display name prefix with a ampersand. A little bit strange uh, syntax, but this is the same as this one in PowerShell. So if I run this one in Azure CLI, you see that it's also sorted, but look at the output is different. I need to kind of uh, open the issue <laughs> to, to Azure CLI or Azure PowerShell guys. Uh, they have those staging regions in uh, output of Azure CLI, and they are missing in PowerShell for some reason. So the output is not the same and should be the same, right? So that's kind of a bug that I found working on this. Question? Can you, can you run the command from line 202 in a table format? 202. Two, two. This one. Sure. I can say dash O or output. Out. I type something wrongly. Output. Table. Uh, wait, I have something wrong, right? Two dashes needs to be for a long name. Thank you very much. And this is the time now for restarting VS Code because I thought that uh, I will be lucky and this bug will not happen to me. Our, one hour before this session, I did the final testing of things and discovered that uh, suddenly Azure CLI will stop giving me any outputs when it's executed in Visual Studio Code PowerShell extension, just like that. The only solution is to restart Visual Studio Code. It never happened in my life. I seriously don't understand how is that even possible. But I tested it with a kind of five commands in Azure CLI, like no outputs. Like, how is that possible? Azure PowerShell, I get output. I run something else, I get output. Then I restart Visual Studio Code, rerun things, and everything works. And then it continued to work for 15 minutes and then start behaving again. So I restarted again, and it worked. And I did it like a five times in a half an hour, and it's like, this is interesting. <laughs> Just before a three hour workshop to have that kind of a bug somehow uh, creeping on me. And so like, if, if it continues to happen, then we will uh, run everything in a cloud shell. Okay, but let me try again. See, now it works. Previously, I didn't change anything, right? Just restart the thing. So as you can see, you can and you get, as a headers, you get things that you defined, name, OS, and admin. You can change uh, to any kind of uh, output here that it's supported. So you don't have to change the, the parentheses from curly braces to? No, no, you just, you just change the output. This is uh, instruction, so here, 
This is just instruction to a uh, command how to do a client base querying of the outputted JSON, and then the formatting is applied after that querying is done. OK? So behind the scenes, what happened is that when I ask for a list of all VMs in this resource group, I got a huge JSON string that contains five or six of my VMs with all the data, OK? Of all of that, I was interested only in three things. The name, the OS type, and the admin username, nothing else. So on that result that came already to my client, to my machine, the query search for those properties and fetch only those three for every machine that you see here. Okay, And then, because I said output as a table, it formatted as a table. If I don't say output as a table, it will be formatted as a JSON. If I say color JSON, it will be color JSON. If I change it to YAML, it will be YAML. Okay, So this part happens after the querying is done, and I fetch the properties that I want. Okay, Now it's YAML. Right? The, the word before the colon is a column heading, name, OS, and admin? Yes. Admin. This, this become the name for table formatting. This became name of a header. So that's not case sensitive, right? Because you said that's not case sensitive. Okay. That, that's usually uh, turned into uh, Pascal casing, I think. Yes. That, but that's not casing. That's not case sensitive. That's just kind of a renaming to what I want. You want to ask something? Yeah, it was just a curiosity. Notice that when your output was set to table, the name of the table column was set for your admin property. Um, in your line there, it's lowercase admin. Yeah, and then it changed to Pascal case. And yes. In YAML, it doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah, it's yeah. It not consistent, as you can see. No. Not consistent. But the important thing is that here, with the values, that we want, we need to be careful about case sensitivity. Because if I say storage with a capital S, it will not find it. Because it will look for storage with a small s. That's the thing, right? Yeah, so that's, that's kind of a, a little, little bit of, a, of an issue there. Uh, so here, uh, let me point to this thing uh, here when uh, uh, I wanted to change just for a resource group to be a group, OK? Without touching name and default host name. So when I tried to do that, I got an error telling me we cannot do that. You cannot specify alternative name just for one property. You need to do it for everything. So this is where PowerShell is much flexible, much more flexible. In PowerShell, you will do it this way. Get AZ function app, pipe it to select object, use a calculated property just to change resource group to be a group, and leave the name and default host name, right? That's kind of a PowerShell 101 kind of thing. So easy in PowerShell. If this works, you will see another problem with Azure PowerShell here is that uh, get AZ function app is extremely slow command lab, extremely slow. It goes like one by one, and in this case, it's not even kind of outputting everything in an order. But you get like every single app after a couple of seconds for some strange reason. Who knows what's happening behind the scenes? And uh, uh, Azure CLI is much faster. So the question is like, can we then use Azure CLI to fetch data, but then PowerShell to format it in an easy way? And the answer is yes. And this is the trick that I use all the time when I convert the default JSON output from the Azure CLI command into PowerShell custom object, 
And then I use my partial knowledge to get what I want, to format the things the way I want. OK? So in this case, I'm getting the best of two worlds. I'm getting the much better performance from the Azure CLI. And then later, I'm using my PowerShell knowledge to get easier formatting of things than with a Jameson path query. OK? Make sense? So let's try that. And again, a bug. <laughs> this is interesting. The same command failed. And this is just a, a, a strange thing, because that should not happen. Let me try restart again. But after that, if it happens once more, we will move, switch to a, a Cloud Shell. It happened exactly at the same command the last time during a practice, which is just weird. I don't understand why that happens. Hmm, interesting. OK. Time to switch to which environment we need. Bash. How can we run PowerShell command in a bash? <laughs> right? We need this one. We need the PowerShell experience inside of a Cloud Shell because we have combination of Azure CLI and the PowerShell. OK? So let's hope that all those things run. OK, so let me clear this. Let's try this. And you can actually see me like typing things. <laughs> and bam, we get very quickly, right? We don't need to wait for every single app. Everything works. We have a header, easier. So that combination of Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI is just awesome, if you ask me, really, right? Especially if you're coming from a PowerShell background, you know how to select things. You know how to work with the calculated properties to change those stuff. So things are much, much better. There's one more thing that uh, on, on this level that I want to show you, and then we will go to things that are a little bit more uh, kind of fun. Because I know this is not fun, but trust me, you will be beaten by this the first time you go to documentation. And you realize that they not provide Azure PowerShell example. They give you Azure CLI example. And you want your results quickly. And you get a copy of the Azure CLI. You run it, and it doesn't run. right? Because there is maybe some problem with the things, or you change something, but you didn't know how to change it properly for your environment. You don't know that every single square bracket in a curly bracket has its meaning, and how to do this stuff, really, right? So that's why I'm going through this in a little bit more detail, that it's not that interesting and fun. But it's really crucial to understand, because at certain point, you will need to deal with Azure CLI just because you will find examples like that. Or you will go to Microsoft exams, and they are full of Azure CLI examples. Microsoft Learn instead of Azure PowerShell. Uh, there is no parity all the time between the two, right? So that's why we are doing it. We can use those query also to filter stuff. In the same way as we have where object in PowerShell, here we have a question mark as a filter operator. So here, uh, the thing is that uh, is default property can be true or false. And we are interested in uh, Azure subscriptions that are default this here. So this is what we are doing. We are then AZ account list from all of those, give me only the default one. OK? We open a square bracket, question mark, is default. If it's true, we will get a name. OK? So if I run this, it will give me a name. OK? Is that kind of clear? Another thing is that I haven't uh, talked to you is that if I say here TSV, tab separated value, that will remove the formatting and give me just a string, which might be useful sometimes. 
or if you need just the value, that's the way how you remove quotes around it. Because if you pass that as a value to some other commands, it doesn't expect quotes. It will fail with them. This is the best and easiest way to remove them, OK? Instead of you parsing something or doing something, just format as a TSV, and it will remove quotes, OK? So uh, the things are getting a little bit interesting if you want to get all non-default subscriptions, OK? The syntax for it can be dual. You can have question mark and then a not operator, exclamation point, which is kind of a reversed, is the default true to a false, and then give me, give me that. So uh, because I have only access to one subscription, it will give me the empty uh, JSON, but it works. There is no problem. The things are getting a little bit trickier here. When you want to compare it to the value called false, you need to first wrap false in the back ticks, and then you need to escape them <laughs> with the escape character for bash, which is a backslash. Huh? Weird. If you want to run the same command in a PowerShell, do you know what you need to do? You need to do back tick, back tick, false, back tick, back tick, because in PowerShell, back tick is escape character. So you know where the problem lies is that if you want to write a code that will work not cross platform, but cross shells, it's a hard work. Because you need to understand all the quirkiness of a PowerShell and Bash and build those strings to work in both. That's not easy task at all. Seriously, like no at all. Because you have differences with the continuation character. You have differences with the uh, quoting, which is probably the biggest uh, problem of all. Escaping uh, things, right? You need to pay attention to all of those. When you are building the JSON uh, payloads, oh, that's, that's like a nightmare to, to do properly, to work in a bash and in a, in a PowerShell, right, right? But the good thing is that those things are documented. But not, yeah, they're not documented in a PowerShell side. They're not documented in the Azure PowerShell side. They're documented in Azure CLI. So there are certain documents in Azure CLI when they give you examples how to run things in Bash, how to run things in PowerShell, how to run the same things in a command prompt. We didn't even touch command prompt because command prompt is not used that, more, that much. I'm not promoting it, but it has its own rules. So all the, those three shells supported by uh, Azure CLI have a different user experience, right? But luckily, those things are documented. And once when you kind of start using that, you need to kind of pay attention how those things are actually uh, working there. So here is uh, another example when uh, uh, PowerShell is just easier to use, if you ask me. We, we have here a list of function apps and I want only the ones that are in the running state, OK? So in Azure CLI, you will need to do first the filtering using a, a question mark, sorry, question mark operator. And then you will specify some of the properties that you want to get back. In PowerShell, that's much easier, right? You get the function app. The problem is only here with the commandlet that it's just slow. And then you will do where object to do the filtering with a full syntax, or here with a short one, and then format table and specify the names of the properties, and you will get the output, right? So it's not that just I'm biased to PowerShell, but seriously, this is just easier. Just looking at it, it's kind of easier to understand what's happening, and it's easier to get that syntax, because uh, this one gets very, very messy very quickly. And, and here is the one thing I give you a little bit later, we will not go through all of them because we talk about most of them already, uh, examples. But this is one that I find really brilliant, is that if you are in a Microsoft documentation and you look at examples, have you noticed that in the right upper corner there is a copy button and open in Cloud Shell button? That copy button is magical because when you click on a copy button, 
it removes the continuation characters so that that code works in both Bash and PowerShell. It doesn't matter if the code that you see in a document in the browser contains backslashes or backticks, they are removed when you use a copy button. If you really want that kind of formatting that you actually see, you need to select with the mouse the code and then copy, control copy, for example. But the copy button magically removes them and write them as a single line, which is just awesome because that makes it kind of a usable in both shells. Otherwise, you will need to kind of a change that by yourself, depending on which is the shell that you are pasting in. Isn't that awesome? I mean, that's very clever because it was not like that before. Before it was like you press the, the copy button, if it's a back, you need to paste it to the editor, change everything to a single line or change everything to a back tick if you fancy that, and then you can use it in a PowerShell. Now it's just removed for you and that's awesome, really. Because it, sometimes it can be really troublesome if the, you have a list of like a 10 different parameters that are there. It's very, very boring to do it. Okay, so uh, you will get code and uh, all these examples, so you will see uh, a little bit later how things are kind of changing between the Bash and the PowerShell, Bash and the PowerShell. I, I'm giving you a couple of different uh, examples for it, but uh, if there is one thing that uh, you should kind of pick uh, after all this is that if you are not happy with the James Pot query, if you find it too complex to learn, just convert to a JSON, or from a JSON to a PowerShell object, and then use your PowerShell knowledge to get to the things that you really care for, okay? That's probably the, the most important thing here. Quotes and escaping and, and, and so much of those things. There's one thing uh, here, I need to move to PowerShell for, I'm right now in a bash, I think. So let me move to PowerShell for a moment. I want to talk to you about uh, completers that uh, exist for certain uh, parameters and uh, uh, kind of a cool trick that you can use. So here, uh, what, what I have is I want to get the VMs that are in a specific resource group. And I say get AZVM and then I say uh, name and I start typing the name of a VM, and I uh, press tab, and I get a list of all the VMs that start with the L-O-N, okay? That's pretty cool, right? Uh, let me just, okay, with enter, you accept the things that are there. So I start typing resource group name, I press tab, and I get completed uh, the parameter name, and now I say, okay, maybe better not to type anything and just to press tab and then I get a list of all the resource groups that I have. So I say, okay, that's the one that I wanna use. I press tab. Okay, it doesn't work for some reason. And I get it. Oh, something's wrong. And now it works, okay? So I got information. But the thing is that it's better if you go the other way around and you ask first for a resource group. And then you say, okay, I want this. And then the resource group name is uh, tab completed. I accept that. And then I say name. And I, when I press tab, I will get not all the VMs, but only the VMs that exist inside of this resource group. So the completer is a, a, aware of the context where I am. So I already completed a resource group. Now I am completed this. And then when I run it, I get information about that VM. Okay? So think about it. It's always better to first complete the resource group as a bigger logical container of things and then to go with the tabs of the resources inside of the resource group. Okay. Uh, another example that uh, they implemented that it's uh, quite cool is for uh, stop AZVM. When you work with the uh, IDs, 
that supports the wildcards. And you can say demo VM. And then when you press control space or a tab, let me see, with a tab. So it gives me a list of the VMs where the name contains demo VM string. And I can, instead of kind of a searching for this terribly long <laughs> ID for the VM, I can use just tab completer and, and go from tab to tab and pick the one that I want and then stop it. That's pretty cool, I think. Just remember, just use the stars around the string that you are interested in, and then you will get the whole list for IDs. Right. So they implemented that uh, here and there. Uh, you might have seen that uh, already, that when I'm typing uh, things, I'm getting some uh, help. This help uh, comes from uh, Azure Predictor, which is a plugin for a PS3 line. And uh, it can uh, help you to, to get things done much more quickly when you type stuff. So if I go with a get AZVM, and uh, if I press F2, I can change between the inline and the list view. So you can see that the source for predictions are twofold. It can come from a history file, or it can come from the internet, from the database that they are maintaining. So every time when you type something, if you install this and enable it, every time when you type it, uh, they send to Microsoft information about the command that you used and parameters you used without the values that you used, OK? So they anonymize that, taking care of the privacy. Otherwise, it will be terrible. <laughs> so they are not passing the, the values. But the values that you are getting in a, predict, is a, in a prediction are actually coming from a cache system when over history and things. So you will actually see the names that you used in your previous typing, right? So it's quite useful that way, but it can be really scary. Right? When you see it for the first time, it's like, wait a minute, this now came from Microsoft and they know that I have in a resource group lab RG machine called Lone DS1, like that's a bad thing really, right? But no, the values are actually coming from your own system but the commands itself with the parameters are coming from Microsoft or from a history, OK? It, it speeds your process of typing enormously. Seriously, I work with that all the time. Question? Is the AZ tools predictor, is that only kind of in, inside the shell experience, or is that uh, also come into play when you're in? So that's, that's, a, that's a module that you need to install from a PowerShell gallery. And then you can uh, enable it for all your sessions. What will happen, it actually will add uh, a couple of lines to your profile. And then it will work for you. In Azure Cloud Shell, it's enabled by default already. So you don't need to do anything. Does it uh, do anything when you are editing within the script window up on the top? Uh, and if so, I was just curious out of curiosity. Okay. Right. So, uh, right. Uh, it works only in a terminal. So, what I'm using, and uh, right now I'm using a GitHub Copilot in the editor, and I'm using the AZ predictor in the terminal. Right. So, uh, and in Cloud Shell, enabled by default. Just be aware of that. F2 between list view and inline view, very uh, easy to do. You can kind of configure that. Let me just show you. So here, OK, this will produce the error. No, not code. OK, made a mistake. Let's go with a cat profile. Car, OK. I miss my cats yeah. subconsciously. OK. And I'm hungry, it looks like. OK. So this is what, yeah, this is the profile from uh, Visual Studio, uh, from a Cloud Shell. So it doesn't have it there. It has some different uh, 
things, but here I can go, let me, that's the one that caused the problem previously, right? Didn't work, but this is, so here, this is the section that will be added to your profile. Import AZ Tools Predictor and set the PS3 line option to history and plugin because you have that control. You can just get it from a history. I don't want to kind of a get it from a plugin. I'm more interested in history. I don't trust Microsoft for privacy things. I don't want to send any information to Microsoft, but just look from a history and fetch me predictions from a history and that will work as well. But by default, if you enable it from a tool, this is what will happen, okay? But it's, it's on you. And I'm not setting the way how it should be done, like inline or because I'm changing all the time with a uh, F2. When I work not for uh, demo sessions, but just for myself, then I use the least view because it's kind of easier for me to see five options uh, just like that instead of online, but when I do it for the demos, it's distracting for people that don't know what's happening and, and why it's happening really, right? So that, that's uh, quite cool to, to, to see. One of the, uh, the things that I also wanted to uh, mention to you is the item potency. So if you are working with the template for deploying things in, uh, in Azure, with a bicep or a terraform, you know that item potency is a very important thing. Uh, we all heard about that, or at least the PowerShell users heard about that uh, term first when they start talking about DSC, right? The point is that you can deploy the same template a number of times without doing any changes as long as the template is the same all the time. So it doesn't matter that you already deployed a couple of resources. Internally, it will check first if those resources are already there. If they are, it will skip a part for deploying them. So you cannot do any harm, right? Everything will be untouched because it's already the same things that you want to deploy and the things that are already deployed, right? When we talk about idempotency, Azure CLI and Azure PowerShell behave a little bit differently for certain things. So, so here what, what I'm doing is uh, I will create a resource group using Azure CLI. Now the Azure resource group is created and I can try to create it again. So in Azure CLI, nothing bad happens. I get the same output as the first time, it checked internally behind the scenes. If everything is there already, it is, skip it. Just output the information about the thing and that's it. If I wanna create a storage account in that resource group, I'm doing that for the first time, this storage account doesn't exist. It needs a little bit more time. And as you know, if you have Azure storage account with the same name with the one that you want to create, it will fail, right? You cannot have two storage accounts with the same name. If someone already taken during the workshop today this name, this will kind of have a problem already, right? This is what you would expect. But in Azure CLI, it does some internal checkup again and it's clever enough to understand that it's already created, so like nothing bad will happen. Once when I get it, it needs a little bit more than I expected, to be honest. Okay, now we have a really interesting error. Operations currently performing on this storage account that requires exclusive access. Seriously? Operations currently performing. What does that even mean? That says author again. <laughs> this is this is this is crazy because this account didn't this storage account didn't exist. This is the first time I'm trying it. I changed the name just before this session to make it fresh. Okay, let's let's move to to Azure PowerShell. So this is the Azure PowerShell experience for 
trying to create the resource group that already exists. Okay? It says like, it looks like you are want to create something that already exists. Are you sure about it? So this is cool for interactive work, but if I want to automate, this is not good, right? So uh, the way to go around it is to say dash force. So in this case, PowerShell kind of enabled item potency, but with additional switch parameter. Right, which you need to kind of take into account. With Azure CLI, it's just easier. You repeat the same command and nothing bad happens. Here in Azure PowerShell, you need to change it. Uh, I'm kind of now worried to even try with a with PowerShell to, to go with it. So, yeah, okay. So in, in PowerShell, you will get immediately if the storage account was created and you need to you want to create this one with the same name, it will immediately fail saying like, you already have account with that name, we cannot do anything about it, right? In Azure CLI, it, it's just happy to run three times the same thing, it kind of doesn't hurt. So you can see that the item potency thing really behaves differently in Azure PowerShell and uh, Azure CLI. Which leads me to uh, another thing here that I want to talk about the biggest improvement in the last couple of years for how Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI behaves. And this is still in preview and it's only built for working with the Azure Key Vault as a testing part. And uh, Damien Caro will tell you more if you ask him about how they are progressing with all the things, but the things look very promising here. This is how it worked so far that Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI will talk to the SDKs and then the SDK will talk to Azure Resource Manager and you will get the resources, okay? And the way how they talk to SDK is different. So that's why we also sometimes get a different behaviors from Azure CLI and Azure PowerShell. Default values for certain things that are not specified directly will be different and we have those inconsistencies. No one is happy about it. This is a big change. What we expect to happen in the future for most of the commands that create new resources, they will be based on templates. They will be based on the same templates that we use when we work with the BICEP, with those JSON files. And those will be kind of a template specs. There will be a library of templates for creating things. And both Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI will use the same. When, which means that we will get completely consistent behavior from both tools without any differences. Isn't that awesome? And in the future, when you go to deployment history, you will actually see the template that it's used for deploying those resources. Right now, you get that from a bicep, you get that from a ARM templates in JSON, you get that from a portal, but when you use Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI, you don't get that. So you cannot reuse them. You cannot put them in a library of any of those things. And the main thing is that you don't get consistency. With this one, you will get because they will use the same template to provision stuff. Question? I'm just trying to wrap my head around exactly what, what you're getting to here. Are you saying that um, under the hood of Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI, they will generating templates based off of what you provided that are passed? They will, they will use the, the, from the library of, of templates that are already kind of a, created as, them, as a template specs, they will use the parameters and argument values that you supply and build the, them in the templates. They are completely the same and do the deployment. So you will not be able to tell once when you look at deployed resources, Oh, this one is created by Azure PowerShell. This one is created by Azure CLI. You can tell that today because there are certain cases, for example, when you don't specify a certain value, and then Azure PowerShell use one default value and the Azure CLI use different one. So I know, maybe it's not the case today, but this is how it was like a, three years ago. If you use, uh, commandlet to create Azure VM without specifying a VM size. The power, Azure PowerShell will create V2 something, v, v, uh, D2 V3, 
and the Azure CLI will create D2v2. And just looking at that size, I will tell you immediately, oh, you used Azure PowerShell. <laughs> you used Azure CLI, right? They were not consistent in that way. And it was hard for them to maintain consistency. With this new thing, the starting point will be the same for both. So they will produce the same results. It will be just on you what kind of a syntax you prefer. Do you prefer Azure CLI working in Bash? Preferring Azure PowerShell and working in, in PowerShell? You know, it will be on you, right? This is a huge change, huge change. I don't think that will happen 100% on all the commandlets, but I hope at least it will happen for those commonly used one for a compute storage network, you know, those commonly used, frequently used things, because that's really needed. You know? That will kind of build the confidence for users as well, because you will not see the inconsistencies anymore between different tools. Doesn't matter if it's a command line or if it's in a GUI, okay? And there are a couple of things they added there, so, so uh, let, me, let me show you that. So uh, one of the things that you need to do to uh, test those, you need a preview version for AZ Key Vault module. 4.12.0 preview. This is the thing that you really need. This is the, uh, the blog post that announced uh, that change and everything and ask uh, people to try it and, and provide a feedback. So that's the one that you re really need. So once when you, when you have it, let me just specify these values. Here is that uh, I think that I already I'm not sure that I deleted it, so let me let me see. Yeah, it already already exists, unfortunately. Okay. So so one of the things that happened, they also uh, enabled now what if properly for Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI. If you are working with a template so far, you know that they have a what if functionality for deploying things with a bicep or JSON uh, templates. Now we have that properly for Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI. So they will actually tell you what will happen. So if I run this using what if, okay, it already exists. Let me, let me just do the thing. Uh, I will just change the name of the key vault. And that should kind of fix the problem. So now they are getting information about the status, kind of comparing what I want to create with the things that already exist in that resource group. They're collecting information, and they will come up then with a report about what will change if I remove what if and actually execute stuff. So this is what will happen. They say, okay, we will use this, uh, we will do the change of this scope with this, and uh, with a plus, we mark the create changes. With a star, we mark uh, ignore. So as you can see with a plus, those are the changes that we happen. This one will be ignored, and then they will ignore one and create one, because one already exists there, uh, key vault, and this is, the report for what if. So now if I want to uh, create that uh, key vault, I want to show you another trick uh, together with, with that thing is that uh, if you do a dash debug, which is really one of the crucial parameters in Azure PowerShell and also dash dash debug in Azure CLI, in case that something's not working properly to get information about what's really happening, and this is the first thing that they ask you if you submit issue in a repo as well, is to give them the debug output. If you do that at the command line, debug output is usually extremely long, and sometimes you cannot even get back to the beginning of it because it will not be buffered, and you will kind of need to find out how to do it. Then, uh, so the best way to do it is to redirect a debug stream into output stream and then save it to a file 
or open it directly in a code and then save it from a code instead of scrolling. And especially if you do that in a cloud shell, trust me, it's unpleasant to do that. And it's much better this way because you will also have it as a kind of a history for yourself. So here what I'm doing is I'm uh, redirecting debug output to the output stream, and then I'm piping the output to debug underscore output txt file, and it will open it later uh, in a code to show you how it looks like. So they ask me first to confirm that I want, and now debug output will uh, be created and, and stored in a file. I will get information about creation in progress. That's also a new thing in that preview. You get information that something is happening, otherwise you will just stare at the prompt and think like, what's happening there? Now you know that something is happening. Can the debug parameter be used with any PowerShell command? Yes. Yes. But for Azure PowerShell is extremely important because it will give you information what is actually happening when you are running it, right? And same goes for the Microsoft Graph PowerShell. I use it all the time. Every time when I get some unexpected results, I use dash debug to see actually the URL that it's targeting in the API. And after this, I hope we will have time to show you the difference between get uh, MG user and get AZAD user. If I go over time for a minute of two, please stay with me because I think you will like that demo. Okay. This needs a little bit more time than I expected. But is the five the level of output? No, I don't know why, why it needs that much because uh, creating a key vault is not that hard. Let me, let me try to do it this way. Okay, so uh, I need to go to CD AG PS Summit 24, okay. And okay, no, let's use code to open this. So, we, okay, we will close this one. So this is the output, the same thing, just different name of the keyboard, okay. So you can see what's happening here. After all the authentication and all that part, we can now skip it, skip that part for now. We are coming to the template part. So here it starts. So you see now that the JSON file, JSON template, is created after Azure PowerShell command, and this is sent now to Azure Resource Manager. In the same way, if we deal with a BICEP or a JSON templates, right? And then this huge JSON file is sent, and then we get those intermediate progresses when they change the progress status from provisioning, provisioning to succeeded, we get all those responses back. So, so this output is quite long, but you can see it here that the template is behind everything, right? This is just brilliant, if you ask me, and I, I'm really looking forward to see that in everything that they are doing with uh, creation uh, commandlets. So here is the thing that I hope still working. Come on, okay. Let's do the funny demo of comparing get mg user and get azad user. You need to be aware that both of those commandlets are using the same Microsoft Graph API behind the scenes. No? As I told you, Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI migrate to using Microsoft Graph API instead of Azure AD API almost a year ago, Meryl, right? Something like that? Almost a year? How they did that change? So this is how uh, it have, uh, behaves in uh, Microsoft Graph right now. Get MG user, and I say select 
properties ID, display name, and a user type, and give me just three of my users. The output is needed. Okay. Let me just go here. Connect MG graph. Okay. Let's repeat this. And as you can see, user type is empty. I don't know are they members or guests. Okay. The reason for it is that user type is not one of the 10 default properties that get MG user returns. Because to save the bandwidth and everything, they decided people will use, will need only this 10. So they're not returning everything else. If you want something that it's not returned by default, you need to ask for it. And the property uh, parameter for that is a dash select or dash property. Select is the alias for it. So I say select user type and I repeat the select part. And then this happens. You only get what you selected, but default ones are not returned. I would like to see a person who made this decision, seriously, because it's something that no one ever expected. I demoed this in front of a close to 1,000 people so far, and I never ever found a single soul that says that's expected. So you realize quickly that then you need to add the others to the select here to get them here in the output. And you do that, and then it works, right? But then you say, like, hey, I would like a user principal name as well, right? That's another default property, so I want that, and I added it here. And then what happens is that uh, that's not there because I didn't ask it in get mg user, right? I only ask it for a select dash object there uh, in the output, but not at the first, right? So. Uh, how you can deal with that with, in MG Graph is first you create an array of all the properties that you want, and then you use that as a variable on both sides. Question, didn't you use dash select star? Dash select here. Yeah, dash select star. Yeah, instead of your dollar props, didn't you get some new dollar, uh, new star? Let's try. Let's try. I haven't tried that myself, to be honest. Because usually that will tell me, like, give me everything. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Why user type is not there? <laughs> oh, this is cool. This is cool. You get only all the default ones, but not the one that is not by default. So can you do star, comma, comma, comma <laughs> user type? Oh, yeah, but star should be there. OK. It's getting, it's getting fun, right? Yeah, I, I, I kept the, the, the funny one for the last one, right? Nope. Okay, so this is the, what I'm using. I'm using, a, a, by the way, if you use the right output and then the name of those properties, you don't need to type quotes and you don't need to type uh, commas. I think your, your casing is wrong for user type. Uh, it's not important here as well. It's, it, it's case insensitive. Yeah, so uh, I use this, and then I use uh, that array at both here and there, and I'm getting it. Azure PowerShell team thought about a user, and this is how they fix the problem. So by default, their behavior is the same. No user type. They're just following what Microsoft Graph API returns. If you ask for user type, you will get user type, but not the others. So, so far, they behave exactly the same, right? But there is a catch, append selected. So with just simple switch parameter, they're instructing get az ad user, keep the defaults, add user type and return back 
user type, user principle, and all the other default ones, and you will get everything with just one simple switch parameter. Okay? As I told you, because development here is driven by user experience, not by API. What happens behind the scenes, and this is interesting thing here, I'm using same redirection for the output stream, and I'm outputting directly to a code. Pay attention to this hyphen here. So code dash hyphen will open the output as a temp file. Uh, what happened here? Let me see. Why this didn't work? Let me see again. OK, for some reason, some glitch in the system. This is what I'm getting. So when you say uh, dash select user type, this is how the URL for get is built. This is why you are not getting default ones. Because they say, like, give me only user type. And that's actually what you do. This is what you get. But when you say append select, how the URL looks now, and you can see the big difference. So the URL now, and this is another uh, cool trick. If you, in Visual Studio Code, if you have a line that it's very long, instead of doing the scrolling like this, because no one likes that, Alt-Z will do the soft wrapping, and you will see everything inside of the Visual Studio Code. It doesn't matter how big the window is. So if I change the window, still things are there, and you can see them. Alt-Z will do the soft wrapping of things, so you don't need to scroll. Very useful for demoing things. So as you can see here, here, up here, or here, the URL now contains the user type and every single default property as well. That's why we are getting the output that we really want. They cannot fix Microsoft Graph API, but they, they change the way how they build the URL that they target. Okay, so that's a great example of how, when you think about a user, how you build your commandlet and uh, provide expected behavior so that people are not puzzled with the <laughs> just the user type without any default parameter uh, properties and things. Okay. Question. Sure. Think with Azure AD, uh, with Azure ID using Graph API on the back end. And I just see in PowerShell. Using the same. So do we still use AZAD user? Is that still? Right. So this, so all, all uh, AZAD commandlets in Azure PowerShell are using Microsoft Graph API. They just don't target all the objects in Entro ID. They target only the objects that Azure PowerShell team thinks are important for Azure deployments and Azure management. So what's the difference between MG user and AZAD user? What's the difference? Yeah. Behind the scenes, there is no difference in a way that they are both targeting Microsoft and work with the Microsoft Graph API. The difference is that uh, get AZAD user is created by uh, Azure PowerShell team with those kind of changes like append select when they wanted us to have a better experience. Uh, I'm not sure, is, are those also auto-generated? Meryl, maybe you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Azure PowerShell is also uh, for, for Enter ID? Okay, so they're auto-generated and then tweaked by humans after. Uh, get MG user is auto-generated, but obviously not tweaked or not tweaked in a way that will be very useful for users uh, right now. So there is a lot of improvements for get MG user kind of things here. The thing is that if you want to fully work with Entra ID, you will work with Microsoft Graph PowerShell because it supports all the objects. It works with a full set of the APIs there. And that's again just one more module. That's another module. That's just one more module. We didn't cover that at all. This is just kind of a, another module that covers Entra ID and all the other services in Microsoft 365. The story behind Microsoft Graph PowerShell is much bigger 
than those AZAD commandlets inside of a Azure PowerShell and the equivalent in Azure CLI. Those in Azure CLI and Azure PowerShell, they are working with the users, groups, applications, um, service uh, principles, maybe admin accounts, I'm not sure about that, but they are working with a subset of Enter ID objects. Meryl? Yeah, I have a session on Thursday on Graph Function. Yeah. yeah. The full session about. And uh, now I might come to that. Yeah. And, and don't miss the Damian Caro session about uh, authentication improvements in uh, Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI. I didn't want to touch that a lot because he has a full session or 45 minutes on it, but this is kind of a complementing this uh, workshop. So that would be interesting for you as well. Any other question? Have you yes. a good way of running Azure CLI inside of a Azure function? <clears throat> no. I haven't tried it myself. Uh, I only played uh, a little with the uh, Azure CLI in uh, RAM books in Azure Automation that is supported, but I haven't tried uh, Azure CLI in Azure Functions. I tried uh, Azure CLI and worked with Azure CLI and Azure uh, PowerShell in uh, GitHub Action Runners. And there is one thing that I want to mention. We didn't have time to kind of a demo that part because, and it's a little bit uh, more complicated than all the others, but still to kind of mention to you, if you have any experience with working with the GitHub Actions there, you know that they are doing the logging with the provided action called uh, AZ login, and there is a way for you to say, use that login to also enable usage of Azure PowerShell. But the things that you can run PowerShell in a runner is that you can use a PWSH shell, or you can use Azure PowerShell action. The thing is that if you use PowerShell as a shell, you cannot run Azure PowerShell on it because it's not aware of the folder when the module exists, which is unbelievable mistake. And they don't want to fix it because they say a workaround exists. You need to use Azure PowerShell action, and it will work there. So if you are interested, I can demo that to you in a hallway uh, tomorrow, for example, if someone can find me just to show you how uh, that works, because it's one of those mistakes that I really don't understand why is it so hard to fix, because it's unpredictable. is in the same way as the user type shows up without any other default ones. Like, the module is there, but the PS module path is not aware of the folder where the module exists, and it's practically invisible to a runner, so you need to go through the action. You know, strange thing. So thank you for your time. I hope you enjoy the workshop and learned a couple of things here and there that can be useful for your work. If you have some additional questions, I'm here till the end of a conference, and I'm really happy to talk about Azure PowerShell, CLI, and all of that stuff. Thank you very much.